Hi, everybody. It's April the 16th, 2015. It's time for my private audio call. Tonight, our scheduled guest speaker is Dean Clifford, but he hasn't shown up yet. So in the meantime, we've got uh, uh, Al asking Carl uh, a question. So go ahead, gentlemen. Continue. All right. Yeah, so the question was, who do I um, address my or send my invoice to? Do I send it to the man that is is the registered agent for... Um, well, the, well, like I said, if Angela just started, if Angela just started, why don't you start the question from the beginning? So, you know what I'm saying? Uh, okay. It wasn't a very good okay. question. All right. So I was in town in, in Baltimore earlier, and I came outside, and it was a boot on my car. So I called them up, used a credit card. They gave me a code. I took the boot off the car, and then I took their boot back to them. So I want to send them a bill or an invoice for my services um, for bringing their boot back. So I just wanted to know who should I send it to? Do I send it to the city of Baltimore, or do I send it to? And I'll let you take over from here, Carl, with your response. So like I was saying uh, earlier, um, the two things you got to find out: one is a lot of times governments subcontract out that kind of work. So like I said, in Baltimore, it might be a contracting company that actually goes out there and boots. You know, like I said, when I worked for Sprint and when I worked for Time Warner, we had to have white trucks. We, no matter what color our trucks were, we had to paint them white. And then they stuck the emblems of the companies on the side of our trucks. But we were not Time Warner employees. We were indemnified under bond or on our own. We had to carry million-dollar policies. And uh, if we did something wrong in somebody's house, they called up Time Warner at Sprint. They said, he's not one of our employees. I said, but wait a second. He pulled up in a Sprint truck. He was wearing a Sprint uniform, had a Sprint ID badge. It's like, yeah, but that's not one of our employees. So before you start going around thinking you're going to go after the mayor of Baltimore and all that other happy stuff, <laughs> give it a yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly gotcha. who and what it is that actually touched, trespassed on your property. You've got to find out, like, the man or the woman who touched it. And say, so who gave you the authority or the right to touch my property? You see what I'm saying? Right, I got you. You see what I'm saying? All right, understood. Okay, then when you come up with that, you know, if you, you know, uh, just, uh, I guess call up on a Saturday show, you know, and I'll, uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Sounds good. And, uh, like I said, uh, I don't know if you know my show, but it's 127469, so just call me on Saturday and we'll go from there, all right? Yeah, not a problem. All, all right, right. Thanks again. All right, no problem, Al. I got to mute out a second. I got to talk to my buddy here, but the next person can ask questions if they want right. to. But, uh, I got to say something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, got, I have a I question, got. though, for you, Al, is how'd you get the boot off? Oh, that's, uh, well, they they have um, a key code that you can punch in. But in order to get the code, you have to pay, you have to, you know, call the 800 number and pay whatever you, whatever they claim you owe them over the huh. phone. And and what what makes it so bad is the, the, the ticket was $32, but the boot fee was $150. Ooh. And then they charge you seven ninety five just for calling over the phone. Oh my God! So you paid to get it off to get the number? Yeah, I paid to get it off. Yeah, because I'm mean, I, I I got things to do. So I mean, I, it's not a problem because sure. I know I can get the money back. But yeah, it, I, it's an inconvenience. So I just had to know who to go after. I've been listening to, to to you for three years. I've been listening to Carl for at least two. So I know I can get it back. I've I've gotten stuff back before, but. Um, matter of fact, I had a court case. They sent me my money back in the, the within two days. They sent me my money back in the check. Oh. So I know oh, I, I, thought... I know I can do it. It's just I just just wasn't sure should I go after the city of Baltimore. But he he made a valid point. They they are subcontracting. I know exactly how that works. Hmm. Um, that's why the boot fee is so high because they're independent Ridiculous. contractors. They're not supposed to be there to make money off of us, you know. Oh, all, oh, all the all tough. the cameras, the speed cameras. All those are independent contractors. So when they when they um, when they send you a ticket in the mail, they uh, the the city only gets like twenty percent of that total fee, mm-hmm. and they get the the, the contractor gets eighty percent. Yep. Amazing. Yeah. Last year, the city made up, I believe a little over two million just on speed cams. Wow, that's incredible. That's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, but that's the thing. That like, like you say, the pen is mighty than the sword. You just got to know what to write. Angela is. Uh, yes. I remember. A, it's funny seeing a couple of your shows when you had Dean scheduled. Um, are you sure that he did? He tell you that he's going to be on tonight. Yeah. 
He did. He confirmed it yesterday. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm just saying, I just remember a couple of times, you know, it was interesting, it was kind of funny sometimes when you were asking, where is this guy? Yeah, you know? Well, I know he gets off work right at 6, so. Oh, wow. Hey, cool. I don't know if he was working or not. Hey, I don't either. Um, I, I got something I want to, I want you to, I wanted to run past you right quickly and just see your thoughts on it, just let it marinate. Um, in, uh, in the book of Revelations in the Bible, there was an account where John was, um, was mm-hmm. having a vision, and uh, there were it was seven seals, and John was crying because he felt there was nobody worthy of opening up or breaking these seals. So, the the angel said to John, you know, like, don't worry, we got somebody to break the seal. We got somebody worthy to break the seal. Of course, that was Jesus Christ. But right. that same that same thing applies. I was hoping you were. I, I, I was going to hope you were going to say that wasn't called Latin. <laughs> no, 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 no. But the same thing applies today. If I put a seal on my letter, and I write at the end of that seal, um, mm-hmm. like for instance, if I if I if I send the letter to let's say let's say I send it to Mister and Mister or Mrs. Baltimore City, I know that somebody's going to open it. But I, if I put my seal on the letter on the envelope and I write under that seal. That, okay, here, um, let, let me explain yeah, Let me explain something to you, too. It's, it's what it's going to be, it's, 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 you've got the city of Baltimore, I'm sure you've got something called Baltimore, and you've got the government of the city of Baltimore. Right, Whenever you're going right. after anything, you're going after the government of something. Right. Of means for the benefit of something. Right. You know, the United States, you know, you know okay. if you say, right. So it's, you, like when I'm going after Alabama, Alabama is basically just a title. You know, the state of Alabama right. is basically people that occupy a certain region on that planet Earth. That's the state. And then if well, I want to actually go to people who actually control the government, like the, the acting agents on behalf of the people, the servants of the people, I'm going after the government of the state of Alabama. Right. Well, okay, I'm not I'm going after Alabama. You, you can't yeah, sue a state. You can't go after the city. You've got to go after the government. Well, yeah, I wasn't, okay. I wasn't saying I was suing them. I was just using that as an example. But I'm, I'm, I'm just telling past, people, a lot the, of people... The, the, but yeah. I'm saying a lot of people ask that question of me, and that's what I try to tell them. You don't go after the United States. You don't go after, the, you know, you don't go after the state of Maryland. You go after, you go after the right. government of the state, and then you go after the CEO. You go after the magistrate. The chief magistrate of every state is the governor, and he's a man. And like I said, he right. controls his agents. Well, so obviously, well, you can go after the agent, and you're going to go after the man who controls all the agents. Right. Well, here's here's my question. Here's my question. Um, in the past, you you were saying that uh, you used use an example like Pepsi Cola. It's not mm-hmm. it's not my place to say that that individual's mother didn't name them Pepsi and his last name ain't Cola. So I'm writing yeah, yeah. a letter to Pepsi Cola and I want Pepsi Cola to open it. And I put on I put a seal on that letter and I and I write on that letter. This letter is for to be addressee only. And right. if you are not the addressee, but you break this seal, you're subject to the contents within. Right. So once they op- once they break that seal, they've now accepted my my terms. You agree? No. No. no? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And a lot of people get in trouble with that. A lot of people get their cause repoed because, like I said, when you you have to have to have an, to have an agreement or a contract, both parties have got to be, you know, uh, uh, in in you know, enjoined it. They have to, you know, you. you it's kind of like it's, it's like I said. If you look in the Constitution, it's called intercourse. You can't just sneak up on somebody in intercourse with them and say that was consent. Even if I write it on the outside of the letter. Okay, you write somebody a letter saying I'm an intercourse, and you sneak up behind and you do it. Okay, what what, what do you think that they're going to call that? Well, no, I'm not sneaking up on you, them because they don't have agreement. to open it. She broke the seal. She broke the seal. She she read it and then she didn't tell you no. So that means go ahead, green light to go. Well, they can send it back. They can send the letter back. They don't have yeah, to open. <laughs> Okay, but like I said, you said somebody broke the seal, right? You said somebody read it. Somebody's now there. Well, I'm, they're, I'm, they're, a, I'm assuming that I'm assuming that, like, say, for instance, if I send it, if I send it, if I send it to um to uh what they call it when you send money back, send money, they, they oh, uh, not payroll, um, accounts payable, accounts receivable. So let's say mm-hmm. I send something to accounts receivable, and I and I and I address it to Pepsi Cola. And I and I put on that I put my seal on it, and then I put underneath my seal. This letter is for Mr. or Mrs. Pepsi Cola only. Anyone yep. who opens this letter 
uh, other than Mr. and Mrs. Pepsi Cola agrees agrees to the terms within. Well, what I'm saying, so, plenty of people that either through the creditors and commerce people or the Winston Shroud crowd, somebody was saying, put a dollar fifty on there, and say uh, a down in the memo, then for say uh, you know account paid in full. And these people, you know, run them, the, you know, like the Department of Treasury, they just run these checks through scanning machines. They don't actually, have, you're not actually delivering it to a person, and the person's not actually, you're not getting a signature and saying that somebody actually accepted this. Okay. Somebody has to accept the proposal. I mean, just, be, just because you make a woman a proposal, you know, in a dance club, and you, you know, you say, hey, I want to intercourse you. She's like, what? You know, you know okay, what, whatever. You know, and then and you, you got to, you know, like I said, you got to, you got to give. Isn't forward. the words isn't on the outside of the document a contract? And if they, like if I said, they, there's certain elements of a contract or an agreement. You know, there must be consent between the parties. You see, there must be full disclosure. You see what I'm saying? It must be in good faith. No, no trickery, no deception. You see what I'm saying? Well, it's, it's like, it's, it's, I got you. It, dude, it's like you're saying I got him with a trick move. You know, that's not cricket. You know what I'm saying? It's it's not kosher. You know, and the jury, is, okay. when they take them to court, if, if they try to do that to me, try to do that to you, you, you just bring them right to a court and say, hey, man, they tricked me, man. They gave me something with a seal on it. I honestly didn't know what the seal nonsense is all about because it's not basically common law that everybody knows. 99% of the people, you walk out on the street and say, I got something sealed with a me. This is like, I ain't right, got a court. Right. This is common law. This is common law land. Yeah, so you if, can't. If they that, to me, I would have it back. But yeah, it's like I found a loophole. I found, like, I found a loophole. I found a trick. So I'm really going to mess a lot of people up. So I want to nail them with this loophole. See, when I when like let's say when this lady like who brought me who's bringing me out to Missouri, she's like, if you could get the IRS to leave me alone by May, you know, I'll give you a nice chunk of change for you know help me. So she's like, hey, mm-hmm. I got a letter back from Atlanta yesterday, uh, a week ago now, and she said they're they're leaving me alone. So I really appreciate it. So uh, like I said. But there was no loopholes, there was no tricks, there was no seals broken, there was no, uh, you know, letter, and it's like at the bottom of the memo we said uh, account paid in full. We didn't do any of that nonsense. We just basically right. asked them simple questions, you know, like simple common law questions. You know, is there a man or woman who's going to claim that I owe this debt, that this debt is true? Is anybody going to come forth in an open court and swear to it? You know, and I'll pay yeah. Just tell me if I owe and I'll cover it. Very simple question, because if you walk out to 100% of people in the United States and you say to them, look, if somebody says you owe a debt, you know, are you going to believe them or are you going to ask them is it true? And it's like, oh, no, if I don't know who this person is or I'm not sure, I'm going to ask them if it's true. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Right, so when you go in front right. of the jury, they're going to ask the same thing. You're going to say, look, all I ask the IRS, that's all I ask them to do, to put it in a form of writing, tend to me the bill, sign it, and say that's the true debt. And I'll go to court, and my name is Susie Johnson, and I work for the IRS, and I'll swear that it's true. And as soon as she does, they say, lovely. And then if she's off by one penny, she bears full liability for claiming something that's not true, due, or owed. And she's going to find herself in awfully big trouble for committing perjury and for swearing against a brother that he owes it, that he's guilty of something that she knows he's not, or that she's not really sure. Right. She's better hundred percent sure that it's down to the penny, because like I said, my mom works for the IRS, and she said, you know what, you can put a thousand of us all of this together, and we give you a tax return, and not one of us will match. We'll all be off by a penny or two, a dollar, two, a hundred, a couple thousand dollars from each other. None of us will hit the same number. It's just like impossible. We'll never come up so, with the same number. Right. So even if they interact with me using that name and I address my letter to that name, because, for instance, like, they'll, they'll send, like, let's take the IRS. But the big thing is, like, they'll the big thing is, like, they'll never put thing, a name on dude. it. The big thing, dude, is, like, the same thing that happened to Dean in court. If you read his transcripts, the judge kept calling him Dean Clifford, and he kept responding to it. All Dean had to say was ridiculous, and Dean was, like, saying to the judge, well, you have no jurisdiction, you got no, you know, no jurisdiction on me. And the judge was like, oh, oh, you better believe I absolutely do. Every time I yeah. call your name, Clifford, you jump. I pull in your yeah, streams like a marionette. I pulled you in your That's strings nice. like a puppet. When I say Dean Clifford, you jump. So yep. obviously, you know that this is a legal proceeding. You know I'm a legal judge. Then you obviously must be in legal land. And I'm pulling your strings in legal land. Now, all Dean had to say is, which Dean Clifford do you wish? The legal person known as Dean Clifford or the man known as Dean Clifford, sir? How may I serve this court? Right. Real simple. He didn't do that. He just kept, every time the judge said, like I said, his transcripts were on his website. Read them. And the judge kept saying to him, look, dude, every time I call your name, you answer me. So what makes you think I don't have control over you? Right, right. If I kept saying peanut butter and jelly, obviously you wouldn't answer. But every time I say Dean Clifford, you jump like a banana. 
<laughs> you come up and you start yelling at me, you start giving me the third degree, you keep giving you going on and on with all your rhetoric, and it's like, dude, you, this court absolutely has control over you. Look what we're doing to you. We're making you jump like a banana. If right. I kept saying Susan Johnson, you'd be relaxed and calm. You wouldn't respond. You wouldn't answer. But obviously, you believe we exist. Right. All you have to say is what name? Dean Clifford, yeah, Dean Clifford the person, the legal person, or Dean Clifford the man? Which one do you want to appear in this court? And which one do you believe you have jurisdiction and control over? And it would have freaking ended a year mm-hmm. ago for him. I told his brother that a hundred times. Have your brother stop answering to this legal bullshit person name. He keeps threatening right. himself. He's never going to get out. Right. But he thinks he's a master of uh, uh, attorneys, and, uh, like legalese. And he's like, I got this all figured out. I got their code. I, I got their structure. I no. got, their, got their policies. I, I know attorney, we have no, it's ridiculous. You don't. Yeah, that's the like, it is. That, thank, God that, uh, thank God Larry, little Bill down in Texas, sent me that letter from some folks up in uh, Ohio. And the judge said, even though you have, you know, legal conclusions and it seems like they're all proper, and it seems like you, uh, you know, have been studying this a lot. Uh, uh, we can't accept any of your legal uh, conclusions because we don't see that you're registered and, uh, and licensed in, in the state of Ohio to practice law. And that exact letter is on my website. So if nobody believes what I said, I keep telling people the judge does not care less what you put into that court. They don't care how perfect your stuff is. They don't care. You know, you're so far down on the food chain, they couldn't care less. Right. Because of two things for, for sure is one is they know uh, an illegal attorney, he's been practicing this stuff. He had to go to school for years to learn this stuff. So when he cites a case, when he makes legal conclusions, they know that if he does, he makes a mistake a couple of times and he tricks the court or he and, he, and he's in like contempt of court, he commits mm-hmm. perjury, he, he won't be able to practice anymore. They'll say, look, we don't got time to double-check and triple-check your citations and quotes. We're not going to do it. So with, every time you come to my court, sir, from now on, we ain't got the time you're going to lose. So don't waste your time. So like I said, it's this lady. I mean, I'm sure she did all her citations and everything. Perfect. The only problem is the court says, you know what, you're not learned in citations or precedents or case law, so, and we're not going to go back and double-check to make sure you did it right. Because when you come to court, we take your word as gold. We're not going to double check and back check and make sure that all these citations and precedents of case law and rulings and codes you're relying on are up to date, are accurate, and they're the latest and the newest. We're not going to do it. So, they, like, you know what? Even though these all might be, they sound wonderful, but you know what? The Supreme Court might have came up with a new ruling yesterday and be in total opposition of what you're bringing before the court today. So, you know what? Exactly. Right. Can't accept any of your stuff. Yep. I mean, it's simple how to handle court. It's not even funny. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's but true. God, God bless him, man. His transcripts are there. His videotapes are there. So you could actually watch how he did his court. Well, not his court. You know, it was his trial, but it was that court. Oh, my goodness. He was just long for the ride as a defendant. They get that court. You know, he couldn't fight back in that court because he's not the prosecutor. The only thing he could do is cover up and take a beating because he's a defendant. That's what defendants do in the prize And when they're fighting in the box ring, what do you do? You defend yourself. Right. What do you do? You defend yourself. You block the other blows. You're not, you're not hitting back because as soon as you hit back, you're the prosecutor. You're the pursuer. Mm-hmm. You're the aggressor. The only thing you're doing is covering up, playing rope-a-dope on the ring, and you just hope they get tired of beating the crap out of you and eventually let you out of jail. Hopefully, you, they figured you submitted enough. You took enough enough beating. You look crappy. You look like hell. You've been through jail for a couple of years. You, you lost a lot of weight, and you know. Hopefully, we beat you into submission, and we'll let you go. You can mess with us again. We'll hold you up a little longer. Beat you up again some more. Right, because you ain't learned the first time. <laughs> Until you finally commit. Or before you become a man. Or become a man and just say, okay, what ma- do you wish the Dean Clifford the man to appear? Do you wish the Dean Clifford the legal person to appear? Which right. one do you believe they can, in? They can never operate in a private capacity. Only a man can. Right. No man, no, because you call me out man to man. Only another man can call me out. Right. You want to call me out? Call me out. I'll accept the challenge. I'll accept the, the duel. I'll accept the fight. I'll accept the battle. Man to man. You ain't going to bring a legal society. You ain't going to bring millions of legal attorneys after me. You know, uh, man to man. You can't do that. You got to fight me one on one. We're going to do this man on man. Yeah. And thank God, this, um, thank God, this land 
is still a common law land where we either call out man to man. And saying, who's, who's accusing me of doing wrong? Let them take the stand and let them swear. This habeas corpus has been suspended. Uh, if it, you know, if it hasn't, then I wish to have my accuser come forth into an open forum, and I wish my accuser to take the stand and read out to the world what I've done wrong to him or her. Not what I've done wrong to my neighbor, not what I've done wrong to society, what I've done wrong to him or her. That's habeas corpus. Habeas corpus has nothing to say about, oh, well, that means I get out of jail and I go home free, like, like he was thinking. That's not what it means. It means I got the right to meet my accuser in open court and have the point to take the stand and swear that I've done something wrong to him or her personally. First-hand knowledge. Not to be afraid. Not to be in violation of the code. That ain't from my end. <laughs> no, it's uh, it was from Al's end. Sorry, I muted him out because there was too much noise. Okay. Did you want to? Did you want to uh, continue the conversation with him? Uh, I, I, if somebody else wants to ask a question, I guess we do that real quick. Cause I gotta get. Actually, I gotta do laundry soon, man. I gotta get ready to go to Missouri. I got no clean clothes, man. It's pretty funny. I've been working for like two weeks straight, man. I basically got clay on everything I own. That's decent. Pretty funny. Do you have a washer and a dryer? Nope. So I got to run into town. Oh. I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that around 3 o'clock in the morning. And then this man wants to leave. Thank God I've got a ride from somebody who wants to go see my show. So I'm going to jump in and hopefully sleep for 10, 12 hours while we're driving. I, I, I forgot all about the show. So they, you know, plane tickets, I'm sure. But, I'm doing like a seminar in Missouri. Oh, okay. In Joseph's, Missouri, and I forgot all about it because I was sick, and I was running around doing this, uh, moving over to my folks' farm, and uh, next thing I know, a lady calls me up. I said, oh, my God, I've got to do a show in a couple of days, so I'm sure airline tickets probably would have been like two, three grand. So I said, oh, man, you know what? I'll just bum a ride from somebody who's coming from the East Coast and going to Missouri, and I found a guy who's going from That's the East Ronda, Coast. That's Ronda, right? No, no, uh, he, he, no, um... Uh, Pennsylvania. He's up from Philly. No, so but I mean, are you going to do a, uh, your show in, in on behalf of Rhonda? Yeah, Rhonda. She's in St. Joseph, Missouri. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, she's Rhonda. been talking about it for weeks. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, so. weeks and moving, moving for I didn't weeks. You know, you called it a show, though. <laughs> well, yeah, it's kind of like a seven-hour show. I'm just going to go up there and perform. Okay. Give the people what they want. You know, I'm just going to hopefully they'll have like a whiteboard there waiting for me, and I'll just point to the crowd and say, what do you guys want to talk about? I said, why well, talk about child support and custody? You guys want to talk about IRS. Do you want to talk about IRS? Spend two days talking about IRS. You want to show Yeah, what? that's always a fun <laughs> subject. Well, just like with Rhonda. I said, you want me to show you what I did for Rhonda? You know, Rhonda had a, she did the Winston Trout procedure. She got she behind did? a, a Okay. Oh, yeah, to go back to $60,000 or whatever, you know, 50, 60, whatever, and whatever it was. You know, everybody was writing everything off like crazy. Mm. And then obviously they come after you, you know, because you're an employee of the United States. That's kind of ridiculous and funny. Mm. But um, who's ever processed that was? You know, that's ridiculous. So then, you know, you got to write letters to the IRS and, you you know, you got to, you know, say, you know, well, thank God. She had three different uh, centers right to her. One said like forty thousand. One said fifty thousand. One said sixty thousand. I was like, oh my god, this is sweet. We got absolute proof that they're, they're committing fraud. They have no freaking clue. Somebody says I owe this. Somebody says I owe that. Somebody says I owe this. Oh my god, sweet, lovely. Are you going to video? Is somebody going to videotape it? You think? Yeah. And like I said, so like I said, that happened to my sister years ago. Uh, she moved out of a, a home, and I and I told the man, this this is a ripoff. This this contract is a scam. I said, you're leasing the house. I'm telling you. I walked around the house the day she moved in, and I said, you're going to owe between twelve and eighteen thousand dollars the day you move out. She said, that's ridiculous. I said, I shit you not. I said, I'm reading the contract, and I was going around saying the windows got to be, the uh, mm-hmm. walls got to be repainted. This much money, five hundred dollars a wall, three hundred dollars for the windows. I mean, I was just walking around, and when she left, the house was spotless. And the, the lady who did the walkthrough, she, my sister said, it's almost Christmas, I need the money. Do you think you're going to give me the $1,500 deposit soon? And she's like, yeah, you know, so. And I said to the lady, well, if, um, say she owes, I don't know, like, I don't know, you find $10,000, $15,000 worth of damages, will you let her make payments over time? And my sister said, oh, stop being ridiculous. They're not going to do that to me. And she said, yeah, well, yeah, we'll let her make payments. And I said, so you do, is it so like, 
other women who have children, like my sister, just a single woman who has kids. And uh, I'm sure you let them make payments all the time, too. She says, oh, yeah, all the time. We let, you know, them make payments, too. We don't, you know, go after them for the full amount. And my sister said, well, that's other women and children, but they would never do that to me. I said, yeah, right, you're a sucker. You're a woman. You don't read the freaking contract. You fell in love with the beautiful house. You have no idea what you just signed. I told you, don't sign it until I get here, and you signed it anyway. So, so funny, on Christmas Eve, she pulls up in my driveway. Uh, not, not in her driveway, saw about that with a kid, and I'm sitting in front of, like, the fireplace because it's Christmas Eve, and she's crying like a baby. She gets a letter. She says she owes $15,000. But what was funny is 15 0 That's how much she owed for damages. And I said, and I took the letter and I just rolled it up. I said, this is fraud and extortion. I threw it in the fireplace. Thank God she pulled it out. In my dictionary, I actually have the response that I gave them, the second letter I wrote to them in the dictionary that I wrote so people could have an example of what's extortion and how to handle it. But then I said to, I said to my sister, look, enjoy Christmas. Let me write a quick letter. Look, I'll fire up my computer. I'll have two sentences. I'll mail it out Monday morning, you know, December 26th. This is all going to go away in a week or two. Trust me. And she's like, oh, I'm going to be broke. I can't pay this much money. You know, I'm stressed out as it is. I said, stop crying. Enjoy Christmas. So the first letter was like, can you please um, give me an itemized statement of the bill so we could pay the bill, you know, so we could and, and move on with this matter and like forthwith. Something simple like that, two sentences. So they came back with the actual itemized statement of the bill. It was $8,700, like $19.67. So I said, lovely. This is fraud. This is extortion. This is communicating threats, saying, if you don't pay us, we want to take you to court with the $15,000. I said, yes, because actually in the Code of Virginia of 1950, it clearly says extortion. If you threaten somebody with a legal procedure, that is also considered extortion. So you can't threaten people. It's like, I'm going to sue you. So you see that nonsense on TV all the time saying somebody's screaming, I'm going to sue you. Well, you know what? That's called extortion. It's just like a Gambino saying, you know what? I'm going to break your legs if you don't pay me $15,000. You know, I'm going to take you to court. That's stressful. It's scary. It's uh, you know, it hurts your uh, status and your character in the public. So uh, to be considered a defendant, and then it goes like on your permanent record with credit agencies that you went into a uh, like a bankruptcy court or you know uh, an eviction court or whatever. You get recorded for you know you'll be known as a defendant. And believe me, it's going to hurt you. You know in the in the financial world as well. So anyway, she. Um, I wrote a lovely letter back to him. That letter's really cool. That's the one I put in the dictionary. I basically just said, we will be more than glad to entertain your suit in any open form within the Commonwealth of Virginia, and I hope that you're willing to answer our suit as well because we are going to not only believe that we believe you committed extortion and that you claimed a debt that was not true, but uh, the, the Code of Virginia in 1950 clearly stipulates under the terms of extortion under like whatever the code was, 16.1301, that communicating a threat by intimidating somebody by a court procedure is extortion. And by uh, and then they, or whatever the other code was for um, a fraud, making a claim that was not true of a debt or making a claim that, sh- that somebody owes a debt that's not true. So I said, we'll be more than glad to entertain you in any court if you will accept our invitation to our court. So we never heard back from them ever again, and that was 2007, I think. Yeah, 2007. So she was like, wow, it really works. I said, yes, believe me, it really works. This stuff isn't rocket science. Okay, Tadpole had a question. Go ahead. You've been unmuted. Hey, thanks. So first of all, I want to say we sure appreciate you, Carl. Uh All righty. I want to let you know I donated a little bit of cash, and the reason I did is because you always made me laugh when you were old (laughs) Carl. Yeah, funny funny for that. You can really learn a lot listening to you, to you go on and on, you know? <laughs> yeah, see, that's all I got to do. I got to make videos so when you see my face, I can make you laugh at my jokes and my face. Uh, I've been laughing at your face. You bought one of my posters, huh? You bought the poster of me dressed as Jesus? Is that it? The Jesus one. I've seen you on, their, on your car. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I oh yeah, my yeah, yeah. Let me let me yeah. get this out, man. Let me get this out, man. I just want to let you know that uh, I was a. Uh, I'm, I'm getting that. terrible feedback. I don't know who it's coming from. Carl, All why right. don't you mute yourself out better? when you're not talking? 
Yeah, what would you do? I turned it off speaker. <laughs> I'm trying to li- let my girlfriend listen in, too. <laughs> but, uh, Y'all Carl, should know by now not to have your speakerphone on. It doesn't come across very well at all. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Go ahead. You've been so. Uh, so when I was a young man growing up, my parents passed away on me both uh, very near to each other, so I never had an opportunity to learn all this important stuff about being a man or you know, operating in the world, in the public and everything. And I just wanted to tell Carl that you really have provided a lot of wisdom and insight for for people who never got that information growing up. You know, I was well, never taught how to be how old is you? I'm I'm twenty eight now. Great, man. I love it because it was funny on Angela's show one time, I'm glad that you're in your twenties. What happened one time, Angela had some hillbilly guy from Texas on and I disguised my because I first came on with my voice and the guy said, oh, no, I am answering any questions from that man. Oh, hell, oh, I know. If he talks, I'm leaving it. And so Andrew was like, goodbye, call. And then I stuck, snuck on, and I said, and I called up a little later, and I said, uh, well, hell, I'm Pecos Pete, and who sees Carl? I can't stand that boy either. What's he thinks he's doing? He's crazy. You know, so it's funny. And I still asked my question as Pecos Pete. But it was funny. Eventually, I started laughing, and Angela figured out it was me. And she hung like a night call and hung up on me. But what was great is a 20-something-year-old, if you listen to that show, a 20, I don't remember who the guest was. And maybe Angela remembers who the Texas guy was. Uh-huh. <laughs> Do you remember who it was? Oh, but if somebody can remember his name, it would be great. Because when she hung up on me, it sounded like a 20, 30-year-old young white guy asked the question, a follow-up question, because he knew what I was going to ask, but she cut me off. So then when he was done, a 20, 30-year-old white girl called up. And she followed the next question that she knew I was going to ask. And then a 20, 30-year-old black guy called up, and he asked the next question to this guy. So it's like, oh, my yeah. God. I got 20, 30 white boys. White it girls. worked out. <laughs> yeah, but what I'm saying is 20 to 30-year-olds who, who knew my spiel so well that they could follow through with it, if, even if I dropped. Yeah. Like, I dropped. You know, I got cut off. I got dropped. They were able to pick up and run with it. They knew where I was. Well, you know why? You know why? It's because we grew up in this age of where liars rule the world, and whenever we start hearing the truth, you know, it's easily recognizable because we are so fed up with the way things go nowadays. And, you know, it's always been like that as far as these young people know. But you come from a time when there was still honor, where there was still, you know, correspondence, and there was still high value in the way men treated men. And that's what we need nowadays in the world. And uh, it's, it's really great that you're still out here doing everything that you're doing and still reaching to people because we all need it. And if we can get all the young folk, you know, grabbing this power in their hand and, and uh, taking responsibility for their lives, then, you know, the lawyers, it's like you said that one day, uh, you know, oh, you don't want to pay me three grand to do this. You're going to go do it yourself. Uh, okay. How about you give me 300, you know, instead, you know, that's a reasonable price for law work. And People aren't doing it it's themselves anymore, and that's why it's gotten so crazy. But uh, I got a question, like a real question. I wanted to run it by you. Um, what do you think about uh, psychiatric damage as injury? The story is uh, that the the guys dumping dumpsters right beside my apartment complex were doing it outside of their, their time that was specified in the code, and there's like civil penalties for $2,000 for these occurrences. I was Trying, I wanted to find out what you think about pursuing, uh, you know, an injury claim against a, a dumping company that broke the code. Yeah, first of all, like I said, first of all, you're probably not going to be able to go up to the company. But well, you're only going to be able to go up to the actual man who's doing it himself, and because then you're going to be found, you're going to find out that his company has told him repeatedly not to do such an act. Or they're going to say, well, this was the first time we've been made aware of this. If they were small, they'd say this is the first time we've been made aware of this situation. They can bring it out to attention and we'll stop it immediately. So like I said, until you actually let the other side aware, that it's called yeah. like in legalese, it's called cease and desist. Until you make them aware that they're doing something wrong, they're not liable. But I know what you're saying. They're out of the code. So you can say, But like I said, the actual, phys- the actual monetary damages are going to be a dollar. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, it's, you've got to show them that because of what they're doing, you know, it's, it's interfering with your uh, ability to feed. You do not have any idea how hard it's going to be to, and to show them that it's interfering well, with your uh, ability I to a perform. Bit of, I did a little bit of research on it, and uh, they said they could uh, your 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 performance at work 
can be uh, evidence of it, and you know, even your like relationship. Like if you have a if you have problems yeah. getting busy with your lady in bed because you that's lost so much sleep. Yeah. That's you exactly what I said. There's two things I think of off the top of my head, right? Performance in bed and. Uh, and so you I know. did make them aware. I called them and left a notice with their with their call center, um, as, as an actual notice. It was a written notice. Uh, and then a second, then it happened more, and I called back in again and got I was put on red alert or something like that. And then it happened again, and I like took pictures of it all. So I was just trying to uh, trying to see if there's anything there, because I did give them notice. They were aware. I talked to the manager lady who was in charge of the routes. Okay. That's what I'm saying. The only other thing that you could do is that um, two things you could do is you got you have, like, a city prosecutor. I mean, what, what kind of city do you live in? Uh, Dallas, Texas, baby. And you probably, you got a city manager, I guarantee it, and he's above everybody. Yeah. I don't know if you know what a city manager is, do you? Yeah, I sure do. Okay. Well, why don't you tell these fine folks who are listening just what the hell the city manager is? Well, the city manager, he's the boss of the uh, the corporate arm of this city. He's like, what is he? He's the head of the city council, isn't he? He's the head of every damn thing. I don't care if you got a man McCheese of Dallas. I'm telling you, the city manager is in charge of every damn thing. But you've got to be in, like, an incorporated city, and it's got to be big. You know, you're not going to yeah. find a... Uh, the city, you're not going to find a city manager in a little town of Lexington, Virginia, where I live, but I guarantee you Lexington, Kentucky's got one. Yeah, I'm almost positive. I think I even know who the guy it is. So what would be the yep. course yep. of action? You, after have that? you have to go there. Until, if, if it's a city sanitation department, that works even better. But if it's not, if it's a private contract, you have to. You know, like me, when I, when I had a problem like that, you actually got to – I loved it, man. I just walked right up to the city manager's office. His door was open. I just walked in. I think uh, – it was hysterical. I just sat down and started talking to him. I said, yeah, I believe you're a city manager. Yeah, well, I got a little, a few things to discuss with you. You know, and he was like, okay. but I wore, a nice, you know, I wore a nice suit and tie, and he thought I was like somebody who worked for me. <laughs> I was just like, oh, you're just like somebody off the street. It's like, yep. He was like, yeah, how no, did you know I even But what I'm saying, he was like, how did you know I even exist? How did you even know what a city manager is? Because they don't well, explain just, this to nobody. Well, because I've been interested in what I, when I first started looking into law, it was because of all the crazy things government does, and I started. In, I was interested. I was like, "How do they get their power? Oh, they got their power from the Senate, and the Senate is a court. Oh, Senate's a court. What is a court? How you know how do these courts work? Oh, every city has a court. Oh shit, every state has a court. You know, okay, I need to really know how this court thing works, and so that's I started looking in and seeing that you know the city council runs the corporate side of Dallas, and you know the Public works work for them, and I really wanted to. I was thinking about pursuing a claim because that's what got me on the claim road. Was I was so mad at these guys for waking me up and all the time. But if, well, you know, I just trying to see how possible thing. that was. Well, like I said, the reason why I'd go up to the city manager is because he's uh, the McCheese guy. He's the top guy up there. So, like I said, he can't possibly say that uh, you didn't make him aware, and then that way you could go after the big dollars. Because all honestly, all you go after is the guy who makes a. Uh, Ten bucks an hour, you know, you're not going to get much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, like, like you always, what if I got this supervisor who failed to train and discipline her subordinates? Because and, he makes 12 bucks an hour. He only makes 12 bucks an hour. So, like, you see what I'm saying? You go in a little guy. Yeah, still after you the man. I can't, I can't touch the corporation. I would only be able to go after the man. Right, you can always go after the man, right. So like okay, I, said, I was thinking, if you want to go into the corporation, you have to go at them as a corporation, and you're going to reduce your status, and you have to be a plaintiff, and you have to play by their civil procedure rules. Yeah, and that means knowing all of uh, Dallas's local rules for court and right. knowing their code and all that yeah, whole crap. If you go, if you go to if you go to a second dimension entity, you have to. It's like Who Framed Roger Rabbit? You know, you got oh, to get that movie. You know, <laughs> right, but that's exactly what it's about. You know, if you've got good credit and if you're a good risk, the second dimension will actually let you participate in the second dimension world. If you don't have good credit with them, if you don't, if you're not a good, you know, honorable person, the second dimension isn't going to let you play. Yeah, I got problems so, with the second dimension right now. They, my driver's license, the thing is, I'm, I'm, I wish to keep my driver's license and, re, not, and retain it and stuff, it's, but it's, they dude, say I owe them a debt for it. Dude, it's not your driver's license. Well, it's not it's your another license. Case. You do credit. Dude, you didn't create it. 
Oh, yes, sir. You know, I understand that part. Right. Good. You're not the creator, so it's not yours. You're just yeah. bearing the burden. Yeah, if I don't if I don't bear that, if I don't bear their license though, other people are less likely to contract with me. So I w- one the last thing oh, I want to are ask you, are you a commercial driver? Well, I I need to operate motor vehicles in order to uh, photograph you the need, motor. No, you need to get, you need to get behind the wheel of your property and take it from point A to point B, right? No, not my property in this case. Not my property. I will oh. go to someone else's dealership and get in their property and photo their property. Same that's the game you chose to play. So that's the, that's what's required. Like if you want to fly a plane, you, don't, you need to get a pilot. That's, that's exactly. So if I don't agree with the traffic court, because the traffic court moved and I never appeared in the court, I never had anything to do with the court. They just deemed that I owed these fines. So now I would address the Secretary of State and try to just negotiate some kind of equitable settlement. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was going to say. Anytime you get a fine, penalty, anything from pump motor vehicles, say, like, I love it. Well, how much you got want to be paid? Ten gazillion, three hundred twenty-seven billion, eight hundred. You've got it. Put in a form of a bill, sign it, and I'll pay the damn debt. And that's addressed in the one, two of things. State, not, two not the municipal the, court? No, the court doesn't. The court's not coming after you. It's the pump motor vehicles of the state, you know, when you go to the traffic court. You know what I'm saying? It's like the state or the city, you know, coming yeah, at you. Yeah, but DMV, the DMV said that it was the court that said I owe these fines. So if I had, so what's okay. going on there? Okay, who's the court? Who's the plaintiff? Who's the moving party? Who's the, who's the petitioner? Who's the one saying you've done something wrong? Yeah, it would be the DMV or going to the city court to petition against me. Okay, like I said, you just have to say, like I said, when I when I get a ticket here in the Commonwealth, they say it's the state of Virginia versus call lens. You know, okay, so so this is, if you get a city ticket, you know, I could get a ticket from the city. I could get a ticket from the county department. I could get a ticket from the state. So who's the, who's the one who's saying the state? Okay, so they're saying the state. Just tell them, look, say put it in a form of writing, sign it, and tend to me the bill. Tell me how someone can bill. I'll, I'll accept it. Just tell me who's going to be the brave one who's going to put their hand, and you know who's going to put their hand paper and no, just paper, pen to ink, and say this is how much show. It'll yeah, never I, happen. I need a signature, right? Just sign it. Just say this is how much show. Needs to be verified. I mean, tell the judge. Tell the judge for it. And sign it. Say you know this. It's it, you know he orders me to pay. He needs to go say I don't order you to pay. Well then, who's ordering me to pay? I did that in I did that in a child support, you know, case yeah. in Alabama. First they steal my freaking kid and then they got the effing walls to tell me I got I owe them something. Oh, I was I like, know. You've got to be kidding me. So I just said to the judge lady, it was funny, she's like she she was like, uh, you know, you know, you some us to appear in court today because 'cause we've seen years have gone by and you haven't paid anything, you owe like a gazillion dollars. It's like Really? And who do I owe it to? To the state of Alabama. So where's the state of Alabama? And she pointed over to the prosecutor's table. I said, uh, you state of Alabama? And he said, yes. I said, is that your first name, last name? How should I address you? And he said, what? what? And he's like, you're the state of Alabama. I asked a simple question. I said, you know, judge right there said, you know, I owe the state of Alabama. You know, where's the state of Alabama? And he said, the literal. He said now are you going to you going to put it in a form of writing, state of Alabama? You, might, you know, your mama named you a funny name. Just put it in a form of writing. <laughs> You know, and tell, you know, I just waiting for the bill. Give me an itemized statement of the bill and a billing of the particulars every week, every month, every year that I owe it. Just sign it and just say it's true, and I'll be more than glad to pay the bill. And so that's and what I'm about to say. And the judge lady, you know, exploded. She says, "If you don't pay this bill, if you don't pay what you owe, you're going to jail." I said, um, "I think you're communicating a threat. You're giving legal advice on the bench, and what you're doing is extortion, Mrs. Gambino." You're going to break my legs, too, when you put me in a cage? She's like, well, you just better pay it. I said, is that legal advice? I said, you my attorney? Are you asking my benefit on my behalf? She said, well, you just better pay it. I said, ma'am, I want to pay it. I would love to pay it. I asked you a simple question. Who do I owe the money to? State of Alabama. You pointed over there. Did you not hear me say State of Alabama, put it in a form of writing, put it in a bill, give me an anonymous statement bill, and sign the damn thing, and I'll tender the payment immediately. <laughs> I said, what part of that didn't you hear, Judge? I want to pay. I'm waiting for the freaking bill. Yeah. Where's the problem, ma'am? And she's like, uh, next case. Yeah, that's when they usually then dismiss one, it, huh? The lady, the lady behind me, oh, 300 bucks. I have like tens of thousands. And behind me, 
said, uh, the judge said, why haven't you paid your uh, a child support, like 300 bucks? He said, well, whatever he just said. And the, and the judge said, give her a brace, pair of silver bracelets and get her out of here. But 300 bucks. I had tens of thousands. And the lady behind me was like, well, whatever he just said. You know, I'm like, whatever he just said, uh, I, I like what he said. <laughs> you know, because he's walking out. I want to. And the judge realized, no, it's not, it's not that easy, sweetie. We know what he's going to do to us. You ain't going to do nothing to us. See, so it's a big difference. It just shifts. The lady behind me just said exactly what I said. The judge would have been like, wow, how many people are figuring this out? Or is this lady behind him bluffing? Does she really know what this guy just said in front? Because of what the guy just said in front, man, he he did, you know, perfect. He's, he didn't say he wouldn't pay. He said he wants to pay. He's just waiting for the form of the bill. He's like, I've just been waiting for a bill. I don't got to pay in a debt. Honor. I don't got to pay out of debt until I got the bill. And I got to know that it's a true bill. I got to know that this bill is true. And somebody will swear before it in open court that every damn thing on this bill is true. And I will be more than glad to submit myself to the bill. Give me the bill. All right, man. Well, I, I, once again, thank you for uh, teaching us all these ancient rules of honor and correspondence and, you know, what corporations and man, what, what it all really is. Randolph Scott to know, and you don't even know who Randolph Scott is, do you? Nope, I sure don't. I know Daddy Carl John, Lynch, I know John Bill Thornton, I know Carl Miller. Yeah, well, Randolph Scott cool. is an actor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Rand, yeah, Randolph Scott, you know, uh, Gary Cooper, John Wayne, that kind of stuff. You don't know, know who that's those are, but... Uh... <laughs> what about them? I'm just saying that's what I was raised up on, man. You know, it was, it was great. I mean, the old oh, yeah. timey movie from the 30s and the 40s, it was all about uh, the honor. good guy old winning honor, right? You well, know, not only uh, that, Carl, you had a huge advantage with your, your parents, you know? Not all of us had parents who were in tip-top shape and, you know, did their job as, as parents, you know? Well, so you had that ancient the wisdom parent. of your dad and stuff. Right, the, 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 right. I would say, like I said, the greatest benefit from any of my parents was my father because what was great about him is he could not read or write. Yeah. So his he wasn't clouded with 90% of the nonsense that your yeah. guys' brain clouded with. He wasn't he, corrupted. Right, he had, to, he had to operate through his life by what he seen was real and what he seen was not real. And nothing, he couldn't read nothing in a book. So he was never confused by delusional fiction or fantasy. You know, he could only relate to what he witnessed. You know, not speculation, conjecture, or, you know, he could only relate to what he seen in front of him was led to, for him to believe that, that he could touch, taste, and smell. It's like, no, this is true. This is what really works. All this other nonsense they're telling you, through my experience of walking planet Earth, he would tell me, it's nonsense. It's not true. You know, so like I said, I got extremely lucky. And you poor people had parents, both parents. See, if both of my parents couldn't read or write, I wouldn't have been this fortunate. One was a, you know, straight-A student, finished out the top of her class, six out of nine, uh, six out of ten awards she got at the end of the year. You know, in an all-girls Catholic business school. It was like the Juilliard of New York of dance or music for just a business majors for girls. So she finished at the top. So, and my dad, he was in a reform school. It was his whole life prison in the Navy, you know. He was a cool guy, man. He was a lot of fun. I mean, he died on a, you know, you know, on his boat and stuff like that, you know. Good guy. He, you know, used to be a diamond dealer. Like what I said, I had seen him for a couple of years, and I said, oh, your dad's out there dealing diamonds in Africa. Like I said, well, like those blood diamonds? He's like, yeah. I was like, you know, legal and illegal meant nothing to him. Somebody could come on his board, his boat and say, well, you know, you can't do what you're doing. I'm like, yes, I can watch. I move my arm left. It goes right. You know, I do, I do fine. He said, no, it's illegal. What do you mean it's illegal? And they could read his paper to him. It's like, I don't read that. That has nothing to do with me. Am I hurting anybody? No. So I'm get off my boat. You know, so a piece of paper meant nothing to him. He was like, I don't know what that paper says. Well, I'm not telling you. It's like, I'm telling you, I, I don't know who you are. You're a stranger. Get the hell off my boat. So my dad knew the simple common law. I don't give a damn what your piece of paper says. Why? Because I didn't write it. I didn't create it. You write this thing? No. And then, then you don't know what it means either. Get out of here. Give me your paper. You know, you're going to bring anybody in court who wrote that thing? That's why I laugh about the Constitution of the United States. You're going to bring anybody in court who wrote that thing, signed that thing? Mm -hmm. Get out of here. Well, the Constitution says, I don't give a damn. I said, who wrote it? Is is this, like, every year they seem to find a a newest, latest, greatest Constitution. Oh, we just dug up in the vault of Iowa uh, a Constitution that predates or postdates this one. So this is the new Constitution of the United States. Oh, Jesus. 
here we go again. All the stuff we learned, we got to start all over again. Oh, forget it. I'm, I'm sure. done. And that's why that's why the points you made about it being our time under the sun. You know, they made the rules back then. It's our time to make the rules today. And we have it such a different world than they have that, you know, it's time for a bunch of different new kind of, well, maybe the old rules should come back in a new way. Well, like but, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get you know off what? and let somebody else have, get on. We have another person waiting in line with their hand up. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me just, I'm going to go ahead and get off. I just want to say let thanks, me just Carl. Take, let, me and, uh, let me just say I learned that from Lysander Spooner. Look at Lysander Spuna and explain how the benefit of his grandfather planting an apple tree doesn't mean he has to eat those apples. Even though his grandfather thought it was a wonderful thing to plant all these fruit trees for him, doesn't mean that you have to eat them or that you have to maintain them or that you have to cultivate them or that you even have to own them. You could chop them down and make firewood. But your grandfather thought it's the greatest thing that he could possibly bestow upon his children, the Constitution or fruit tree. You see what I'm saying? So I learned from a lot of – and, and all, all the Santa Spooner was was a, a postal clerk. He had a little uh, general deliver, general store like a, <laughs> on a, what do they call a petticoat junction kind of thing. And he just ran a little mom and pop, you know, but 90% of his business was generated from people coming by to use their mailbox service that he had. But then the postal service came in and uh, eliminated 90% of his customers coming to his store. So he was really pissed that how dare the United States take away all this – uh, business from the private man and make a corporation, you know, be the United States Postal Service. So, like I said, he was like Santa Spoon was just a, like a guy just like me, just a chill, normal, blue collar yeah, schmo. Like you, Carl. You were just a motorhead, and I'm sure now that you're going to change the world. You know, you've already changed the world as far as I'm concerned. I've I've learned a lot from Uncle Carl. <laughs> He's changed change the world for a lot of people, I think. All right, I'm going to get off now. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Oh, no problem, guys. It was funny. Some some man called me up today, and they say they named their newborn daughter Calicia Lenseth Little. And the last name is Little. But the poor kid, I can't, I can't imagine what she's going to have, have to deal with in school by having a name like Call Calicia <laughs> Lencia. <laughs> I was like, what? They're like, okay. Why do you call a caller or Callie? Yeah, really. It's like call easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like, oh, my well, that's goodness. Different. That poor kid. Yeah. Um, let me just make an announcement here. Dean Clifford, if you're on the call, press star eight, and I will unmute you. Otherwise, we're going to continue on. Carl is filling in nicely for you. Hopefully, you'll be there. Are you going to be on for a little while yet, Carl? Yeah, I'm just taking care of the animals right now. I'm, I'm fattening them up with uh, tons of chopped meat. I do this before I go on any trip. And uh, I got one cat that I call Fatso because I, I put about 10 pounds of ground beef down, and she must have ate like eight, and her ribs expanded so big. I was oh like, holy God. cow. Yeah, but now she's back, mm-hmm. oh, okay. yeah, she's back to normal. Yeah, she's back to normal size, but I still call her Fatso. You know, I was like, "Go with you did to yourself." You know, she was more like a balloon. She was just about as wide as she was long. It looked ridiculous. But you, had, you said you have someone there that's going to tend to them while you're away, right? Yeah, the cats, uh, they stay in the house, and I give them a ton of food. And then the dogs, they're going, they're going over by my neighbors. Okay. Well, how long are you going to be gone? Uh, the man wants me to. We want to leave at like six o'clock, five, six o'clock, Friday morning. It's going to take us about twelve hours to get there. So we'll get there hopefully around six, seven o'clock at night, and uh, Saturday and Sunday's the show. And then how long till you get back? Like ten, twelve hours, and then I get right back to uh, well, the backhoe. You know, my folks got a nice farm. It's huge. People don't realize how big it is over there. So when I say I'm going back towards my folks' farm, uh-huh. I already got I already got my own trailer set up. You know, like acres away from their house, so it's nice and quiet. Uh-huh. And well, my kids are grateful to tell that I'm back. It was pretty funny. Um, like I said, it was uh, actually videotaped. I hadn't seen my kids in years, and I got lucky. A man from Australia flew out here just to meet me, just for the day. So he, he, I seen a number that came up from my family, like a family's home. And it was my family calling me. I was like, wow, you know. So I answered the phone, and he says, no, I'm up here. He says, I found your address. I said, that's my old address. And he says, well, I'm like here. I said, you know what? Stay there. You know what? I haven't seen my family for years. You know what? This is going to be funny. You stay there. And if anybody comes, you know, I'll, I'll tell them, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll be right there. So I went up there, and I knocked on the door, and then my mom popped out. And she was like, oh, it's been a while. I said, yeah, it's been like, what, like five years? She said, no, it's been seven. And I said, uh, yeah. I said, I seen a guy in the driveway who waved him down. I said, hey, come on down here. What's your name? 
He said, my name's Pat, and he's got a crazy Australian accent. And my mom's like, oh, my name's Pat, too, and it's St. Patrick's Day. And I said, yeah, why are you here in the United States? He said, I just wanted to talk to you. So, oh, you flew 24 hours here in the United States, and, you know, what? where did you land? Washington. Oh, you just came out here to find me, huh? Like, yeah, I just got to ask you some questions. So I was telling my mom here all the time. So my mom said, so when you're in the United States, you're going to check out the sites and you go to watch back to Washington tonight? She's like, no, I'm getting back on a plane going home because I just want to come talk to you for a couple hours. But it's impossible, wow. to, get him, but it's impossible to get him on a phone. So it's so funny. My mom was telling him, she watches me on YouTube and my kids watch me on YouTube so they know who I am and they know what I'm doing. And they like the comments that they read on YouTube, so that works out good. And they're like, look, Daddy's not in jail. But what was funny is... Um, my kids were at Girl Scouts at a, at a church. My mom said, look, i got to go pick up your kids at Girl Scouts. You know, come along and take a ride. So I said, okay. I followed him along, and I got an old Smokey and a Bandit car, so I put my Downs boy in there, and he liked it because it was loud pipes and stuff. So I gave him a mm-hmm. ride to, down into town. I hadn't seen him in seven years either. So, But wow. he's functional. He's a good Downs kid. He's a happy one. So what was funny is I got to the church, and there was like 12 girls there. I said to my mom, I don't have a freaking clue which ones are mine. Can you point them out? And she said, that tall one and the one with the long hair. I said, oh, okay. So when I went outside, you know, I videotaped me meeting them for the first time, and I introduced the Australian man to them, so that was good. So they kind of knew. It's like, look, Dad's not in jail. Dad's not selling drugs. Dad's not running from the law. I've been really busy helping people like him. And, I, you know, hopefully now I'm going to start slowly coming back into your lives. I said, I think I pretty well got everything done I need to get done. You know, I said, I think I pretty well got this thing in roll in gear that it needs to go in, and I think I could basically let it loose, and it'll take on its own life. I said, so, you know, maybe a couple more trips, you know, and then uh, do some uh, DVDs, and uh, I'm done. Well, that'd be good to get to know them again and be part of their lives. That's wonderful. Well, what was good is I only spent 10 minutes when I said to these kids, I said, but look, I really got to go now. This man needs me to talk to him. I'll catch up with you guys real soon. So it was funny. My niece called up my sister and said, look, his daughter just called me and said, we just met Dad, hadn't seen him in seven years, but the visit was real short, so I wish we could have seen him longer. So I was like, yes, because I thought they would say, how dare he shows up in our life after all these effing years. I hope that clown never shows up again. So it could have went one of two ways. So I kind of got lucky and it went a happy way. Because so they said never show up in my life again, I would have never showed up. I would have said I respect that. You know, if that's how you feel, I don't blame you. And I would have just went on in my life. But they actually, the, they said that they actually wished the visit was longer. So that gave me a good uh, indication that they really want to see me. And uh, what was funny, my daughter wrote this email to me. And uh, it was funny. She says, um, well, hi, Dad. I just wanted to let you know that I go on your website sometimes and your YouTube channel. You're a great talker, and i got to stop cursing, I guess, so much. Now I know that she's listening. Yeah. <laughs> it says, I saw how many comments and likes you got. Congratulations. And I also have your email. Please don't tell your mom, grandma. She would be very mad, <laughs> and she would take my tablet away from me. <laughs> she's not supposed to be on the Internet. My mom was so proud. How old is she? Uh, Twelve. Okay. Well, my mom, my mom was, was, that was one of the first things my mom was so proud to tell me, and your kids aren't have no access to the Internet. So, so she said, don't tell Grandma I have access to the Internet because she's going to get mad and take my tablet away. And she says, um, next time you come over, once you read this, I would like to show you the ponies. they got ponies over there now. And she says, bye, Dad, and I really love seeing your dog, Precious, and she spelled it like press, like you press grapes. And she says, that's how you spell it. I'll talk to you soon. Go let let's. And, uh, you know, so like I said, it was nice that um, she said, P.S., my email is from my favorite show, Merlin. I have no idea what Merlin is. But um, I guess I'm going to have to try to figure out what Merlin is. Yeah, look it up. Google it. Okay. Anyway, you want to take another question? Yeah, I guess so. I just want to tell people how it worked out because I know some people are trying to figure out, you know, how this was working out with me and the kids. And you know, like I said, I had, and I'm serious. I haven't seen them. I thought it was five years. My mom said, call. It's been seven. I live 30 minutes away. You know, because I've been so busy doing this. This is why I said, this is why I left. I told him, look, I got to go. I said, you, you guys are pulling me in one direction of the law, and my studies are pulling me in another direction. I said, either I'm going to do the law or I'm going to just be a normal dad. I said, I think I got to be, you know, something a little, you know, I think God's pushed me in this direction for some reason. I said, so let me go, and I'll be back as soon as I can. I thought it was going to be four or five months, three four months. I don't even think five. I think for three four months I'd be done. 
kind of, it's like, how simple is this stuff? How much do I got to possibly convince people? How much do I got to talk them? Do I really got to do? People are going to pick up. Like I said, the first show I did with you, that, that I always tell people, no, listen to the show before the show I did with Angela and listen to me beating up on some guy. And Angela's like, well, if you're so smart, why don't you come on the show and why don't we have a beat up on you for a while? It's like, I don't have nothing to say more than an hour, hour and a half. I said, the stuff I do is so simple. I can't, I can't possibly hold any belief that I could talk for an hour, hour and a half, and anybody could possibly care what i got to say. And she says, well, if you can't do it for an hour, hour and a half, she says, I'll, I'll, I'll shut the show off, and we'll just have an early night. So I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And then you said, well, call it three and a half hours later, and you're still talking. So I guess you did it. And I said, wow. I said, I don't think people really didn't know this stuff. I didn't really think it was that you know, difficult to understand the first time I said it, that I needed to repeat it twice. Or years knowledge. later. What is it, two years later, three years later? Yeah, it's crazy. But like I said, I'm, I, my kids know me now, and they, they actually Good. like me, so I'm going to start backing off. Good. That's wonderful. Teach them what you're teaching us. Oh, they they watch me. They said on YouTube channels, and they said I'm a great talker. So they said, oh, I'm a great talker. I better stop cursing so damn much. <laughs> yeah. My 12-year-old kids listen to me. You know? So do your, your moms raise them? My mom, my, my mom, oh, I knew as soon as that kid had downs, the minute he had downs, I said, oh, my God, what a gift to grandma, to my mom. I said, it, it, it'll give her something to do in her older years. And she always wants to, she always tried to bring all my brothers and me to the opera, to plays, to banquets, to art shows. And I was like, oh, Jesus, Lord, no art museums. Come on, Mom, give us a F, no, no, come on, stop. So at least she could drag him around, you know, dress him up in a nice, you know, tuxedo, three-piece suit and tie. And he'll be more than glad to go. So I said, oh, yes, this is what Grandma's been needing since she had her first son, somebody to escort her these ridiculous operas and who will actually sit there. <laughs> and maybe I agree with you? Up. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I just knew it. Yeah, oh, yeah. I just knew somebody that she could take care of in her, you know, golden years. and, and Where's somebody their mother? Would, you know, if you don't mind me that? asking. Where's their mother? She's in Alabama. She's just doing her own thing. She doesn't like the style up here. You know, she tried to live up here in the, in, the, in, the, in the farmlands, in the country, and she just couldn't stand the Mennonite, Amish kind of. We, like I said, we, we, the church on uh, just on the side of our property is Jehovah Witnesses. She just can't stand, you know, that. She's just more of an 80s girl, you know, 70s, 80s girl. Who was oh, it's to just leave here. her children? I mean, I don't know. I find that a little <laughs> strange. It's kind of good because by the time she was their age, she was drinking, you know, bragging about smoking cigars, never going to school. So that, that really, my mom's a much better positive role model for these kids, wow. trust me. Mm-hmm. They're going to church. They're uh, going to Girl Scouts. My wife would never know that. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not my wife, but it's the mother of my children would have never... Uh, Brought him to church, ever. She always said, nah, it's ridiculous. Church, then who needs church? Eh, you know. So I'm glad my mom's doing it. Well, I'm glad it all worked out. and You're going to be able to watch them grow up and share not your knowledge with them. It's well, that's good. what I said to my mom. I said, I better, uh, I better start, you know, dealing with these kids while they're still 11, 12, 13, kind of yeah. years old. Because yeah. they're 18, they're going to say, F you, buddy. I don't need you. I got this. How old is the out. youngest one? 2004, so I guess that's 11. Okay, so you have an 11 and a 12-year-old? Yeah, 11, 12, and 14. The Downs boy is 14. Okay. But he's functional. I mean, he was walking around, you know, feeding the dogs when I went over to the farm today. So, you know, my mom, you know, says, you know, can you go out there and feed the dogs and take care of the animals? He'll be more than glad to do it. No no crying, no whining, no hissy, no throwing a fit, you know. Thank God she finally got somebody like that. I knew it. As soon as I said, oh, my God, I just hope... There's two kinds of Downs kids, perpetually sad and perpetually happy. I said, I hope I get the one who's always smiling, not the one who's always frowning. And I got the one who's always smiling. So I was like, oh, oh my God. this is I got so lucky. Yeah. I feel bad oh. for the parents who have those Downs kids that are always frowning. Mm-hmm. It's tough enough you know, without them frowning. Yeah. And that's why I said it's funny. I said that to the um, people at um, social services in the hospital years ago. Because uh, when he was first born, a couple of days after, they thought he was, uh, had Downs. And the mother of the kid said, what does that mean? I said, I know, mongoloid, mongolism. And they're like, oh, we don't call mongoloid people that. Oh, we don't refer to I said, look, the mother of the child understands mongoloid. You know what mongoloid is? Yeah, you know what the doctor, Mr. Downs, the doctor is? He's like, no, I don't, never heard of doctor. The doctor Downs man who, no, I never heard of him. Like And like Alfred Downs is like, who is it? No, she's I don't know who, I don't know who this is. 
I said, but you know what mongoloid is? She said, yeah. You know, so like I said, one little tear fell out of her eye. You know, that was it. That was the biggest outburst. And I just laughed. I said, oh, man. I said, this was, you know, an answer from God. I said, I, I got this all figured out. I see exactly where this is going. And I didn't tell them. I said, oh, this kid's going to be hanging out with Grandma. <laughs> this is Grandma's greatest gift. The wife thinks the mom ain't going to want him. She's going to have no problem turning him over to Grandma. And uh, Grandma's going to love him to death, and she he's going to love Grandma to death. Somebody she could take care of, and he's going to take care of her unconditionally. So it's like, this is perfect. I said, my mom's going to have a little buddy for the rest of her life. Oh, well, I'm glad that worked out. You know, well, you've got, you got, like, got, you know, you got a son like that, right? That You know, he's going to be basically your buddy for the rest of your life. Well, yeah. He's yeah. got brain damage from a motorcycle accident. But uh, right. he, does, he, he's can't remember, he can't remember five seconds ago. Right, but he's a little coherent and he can communicate with you, right? Right, yeah. Right. That's what he, he that's what my mom's kid is, right? He's the same kind of thing. Yeah. His brain you know, his brain's not fully functional, but you know you know, he's there. He he could talk back and forth. He could, you know, perform simple tasks like, you know, go you know, wanna feed the dogs, go take care of the ponies with it, go feed a goat. He'll do it. And that's why I told them women at social services, they said, Well, how are you gonna provide for him? I said, Are you kidding me? We live on a farm. My mom's gonna hand him a bucket and I said, Go feed the that's goats. Wonderful. Yeah. I said, he's going to be fine. I said, the goats are going to love him. He's going to love the goats. And, uh, and w- we don't need anything else. We've got this covered, ma'am. And he's like, well, what about, like, him schooling? I said, ma'am, come on. He ain't going to be the next Alfred, uh, Albert Einstein. He's fine. we got his covered. I said, God made him to do this. We're going to accept it, and we're going to go on. Everybody can't be Einstein. We're fine. He's going to be all right. God will provide him. Don't worry about it. God did this. God designed him and made him this way. For some reason, you know, God will reward him in the next lifetime or whatever. Maybe this is maybe this is God's gift to man. Down's kids. I don't know. I'm just going to play the hand that God gave me. I'm not going to whine about it. That's it. That's what I say, too. You know, well, every once in a while, you, so someone will throw you a wild card. And you can yeah. work it to your advantage. But this is that well, hand you're dealt. And yeah, well, so make the best little, of it. That's it. Yeah, make the best little, of it. Stick. I said that to the hospital staff because they were trying to get a negative reaction out of me. I said, well, they said, you know, he's going to be deaf, dumb, blind, and crippled. I said, yeah, and? I said, I, I said, I know how to raise a plant. I said, you said he's going to be a vegetable? I said, yeah. I said, I'll put him in the sunshine and window in the morning, and I'll move him over to the evening sunshine. He'll feel the sun come up and the sun go down on his face, and uh, we'll have a lovely day. But is he deaf, I, dumb, and blind? No, but they were trying to scare us. They said, can't yeah. you just sign him over to the state, and we'll take him as a ward of the state for the rest of his life. And I said, no, the God never gives a man nothing more than he can't handle. So if you're telling me he's going to be deaf, dumb, blind, crippled, he was only pound, four and two pounds and nine ounces. So, mm-hmm. they, so it was like, so if he's not, you know, if this is the best he gets, I said, uh, God never gives me nothing I can't handle, so God must think I'm one hell of a tough son of a bitch to give me a kid who's deaf, dumb, blind, and crippled. Yeah. Right? Oh. Anyway, they're like, well, <clears throat> this is a, we never heard anybody look at it that way. I said, come on, what other way is that to look at it? Cry? I don't know why these people. Where, who, oh. I don't know where these people come from. Yeah, but like I said, they're the kind of people who, like I said, they do standing, they do standing ovations when a doctor comes on and says, "Look, if these kids are born, you know, and uh, they've they got autism, you know, by the time they're three years old, if they're not cured, you know, we'll still give you the option to, um, you know, euthanasia, you know, abortion." Oh my God! Oh yeah. But there's people that actually believe in that, that if autistic kids don't show some sort of, you know, cognizance by the time they're three years old, we'll still leave it open, you know, like a buckle, you know, like a, a Obamacare, whatever that's called. Uh, I keep keep forgetting what You know, the Bushes called. did that. What's that? Barbara Bush and George Bush, they had a daughter, another baby. And right. uh, it was there was something wrong with it. They didn't really specify exactly what was wrong with this child. But uh, Barbara and George took the kid to another state, they said, for some, you know, experimental treatment, but the child died and was buried in that state, nowhere near the family plot, you know, in uh, wherever it was. Uh, yeah. I they were but like plot. I said, uh, my, my, my uh, first wife actually, you know, got to spend about 20 minutes with George Bush Sr., and she said he was just a regular, small, normal guy, so... You know, like I said, you see, he liked, you know, laughing, joking, picking, you know, so. Evil. Yeah, and it was funny. He was actually in a, he was doing a, um, 
governor's convention I have in Las Vegas all the time. She was a taxi driver, and so was I. And what was funny is she had to drive a speech rider from Golden Nugget, and he wasn't done with the speech. So they said, you know where the security entrance is, the Caesars? And she's like, no, I know where the forum shops is, the the, the casino and uh, the hotel. I don't know. I never went to the security entrance. And he's like, well, it's in a, in a parking garage. So Bush Senior was waiting for the speech rider, and he took a look at it. I was like, oh, wow, you're a cutie. All the taxi drivers are as cute as you. And she said, well, oh, Mr. President, you know. And she's like, oh, and you're Southern, too. She said, he said, do you mind if I jump in your cab and go over the speech? And she said, well, Mr. President, hop right on in. But he didn't jump in the back with the speech writer. He jumped in the front seat with her. And he was just hitting on her, flirting like crazy. And the speech writer kept saying, George, we got this 50 governors waiting. Come on, you know. She's charming and all, but we got to go for the speech. And then she just kept saying, we'll be right with you. <laughs> we were just talking up here. And it was funny, I can man. barely was, understand you. What's happening with the sound? Well, what, was, what I was trying to say with, uh, with, with meeting him is, um, like I said, I didn't really believe that she had met him. Oh. And that was how I knew she met him. I said, okay, where is he from? And I bet you get, you can guess where George Bush Sr. is from. I was he's wrong. From, if I said that. Uh, What's that? What is that? What is one of the, from the East Coast. I forget the state. It, um... Right, but that's what was funny. I said to her, I said, oh, yeah, you really met him. Are you sure you didn't mean him in person? Are you sure you really met the you know the president? Are you sure? And she said, yeah. So where did he say he was from? Because my wife couldn't read or write. You know, so I said, you know, because she's uh, American Indian. And she just picked tobacco when I met her. You know, she was jet black on her legs for picking tall tobacco leaves. So I said, oh, yeah, where'd you meet him? You know, like, what's his name? You know, where, where, where'd he come from? And she said, um, he said he's from Kenny, Kenny, Bunkport. Kenny. And I said, Kenny Bunkport? She said, damn, if that's not where he's from. And I said, oh, my God, you didn't meet him. <laughs> it was like, you know, it was hysterical. So he's just a normal guy because she said, look, she said, Mr. President, he says, look, Bill Clinton's the president now. Don't, you know, you know, call me George. And he's like, no, until we get another real man in the White House, sir, I'm going to call you Mr. President. And she, she said, mm-hmm. what that bill is doing to that poor wife and child of his and sleeping around and making it all public. She said, I, I, you know, until we get another man like you in the White House, you're the last president I want to recognize. So she's like, well, you voted for me then. She's like, no, sir, we did not. She said, we only voted one time in our lives or we'll never vote again. She, she said, well, who'd you vote for? I said, Ross Perot. And my husband and I, you know, me and her voted for Ross Perot. And she said, because he talked beans and taters. And she said, you kept talking one world order. And we don't, she said, I don't have a clue what, what you're going on about. You're just talking way above me. She said, but we like Ross. He talked beans and taters. And we voted for him. And she said, well, you know what happened if you voted for him? She, she, she's like, yeah, no, vote for Ross was a vote for Bill. Yes, we know. We'll never vote again. If you run again, we'll vote for you. Oh. So he's like, yeah, so it was, it was a lot of fun. She invited him. She said, well, we got a mobile home. We rent out there by Nellis Air Force Base. Why don't you come on out? We'll have a barbecue. She said, I really love your wife. Bring Barbara along. And, and, and it was so funny. She said, she said in the, in the, in the, the press uh the speechwriter says, come on, we, we've got to go. There's 50 governors waiting. Come on, we've got to go. So then uh, she said, he said, well, he'll just call me George from now. And, you know, and she uh, she said, uh, he said, did this man pay you? And the meter said like $18.20. He's like, yeah, hey, he gave me $20. He's, he got out the speechwriter. He said, look, you represent me when we're in a public. He's like, look, I take limos everywhere with you. I missed it. I only had $20 in my pocket. You're lucky I had 20 So he says, uh, can I give you a tip? And she's like, oh, no. He says, wait a second. You want to give me a tip? Make sure you sign it and give me a tip because my husband never won't believe I met you. And she said, and she, he started signing a five dollar bill. And he she said, wait a second, you're defacing the money. Isn't that like a crime? She said. He said, well, if you don't tell nobody, I won't tell nobody. <laughs> and then uh, the, then the last thing she said and was pretty funny. She says, well, you know, you know, he, he said, look, please call Bill, Mr. President, because he's the president. He deserves to be called the president. And she says, well, let me tell you what my husband says about Bill Clinton. You know, he said that he smokes, but he doesn't inhale. He's like, yeah. He said, well, he's probably, my husband always says he's probably the same kind of man that sucks but won't swallow. And he said, he said, the president, uh, Mr. Bush, started laughing his ass off. She says, can I use that in the speech court day? She said, she patted him on her leg. And she said, I don't think my husband will mind one bit, Mr. President. You just go ahead and use my husband's joke. I think, I think he'll be okay with it. Yeah, well, they're so good friends, the Clintons and the Bushes. So. What I'm saying, when you actually sit and talk to these people, and this is what I try to tell you people, my mom was a federal tax auditor. She, she was evil in cotton, you know, and, you know, it, it was, you know, because everybody hates tax auditors. But she was my mom. She was a great lady, takes care of town's kids. You know, she, 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 she used to teach catechism. 
you know, teach kids, you know, church. And my uncle's the president of Banco de Ponce, the evil IRS bank in Puerto Rico. Now he's in charge of collections of Visa, but he's about the nicest man you'd ever want to meet if you actually sit down and talk to him. And he says to me, when I talked to him on Easter a couple of years ago, he said, look, all, the paper comes across my desk. I don't know what statute staples are. I don't know what you're going on about. I have no clue about the history of banking. I have no idea what this Rothschild nonsense is. Look, my secretary comes in, she hands me a form. I make sure all the boxes are filled out. I stamp it, and I push it off to the legal department. He said, that I do my eight hours. I go home. I drink a beer, hang out with my kids, and barbecue all night. He said, I don't have a freaking clue what's going on, and I don't care. The same thing my mom was. She don't care. She, the Irish people, they don't care how the nuts and bolts, how the machine works. They don't, they're just employees. They get okay. nice checks, and they go home. They don't right. care. I think we got that's the where message. It's, yeah, and that's why I try to tell people, don't be afraid of these people. Talk to them man to man. Um, you know, Gnostic one has, got, has had his hand up for an hour. <laughs> you want okay. to answer a question? Go ahead, yeah, Gnostic one. Yeah, we'll do that one. real quick. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Gnostic one. You've been unmuted. Thank you, Angela. Thanks for uh, doing a show. Sorry for the hey. long time. Hello, Carl. <laughs> hey. Um. We were on Skype room yesterday, and um, boy judgment came up, and um, abnicio. Yeah, and these words yeah. have been used. And yeah. there's the man abnicio, in abnicio, uh, right from the very beginning. Abnicio, boy, the judgment, right? Abnicio, right? Uh huh. Would you have you ever used anything like that, or has anybody you know ever used anything like yeah, that? Would like you use with, something like yeah, that? Yeah, compared with, right. I just say I want to go back to the status and standing I was before I encountered this court. I want to go back to that of being a man. And you know, one think, I think, and then, No, and then I say to them, I said, I believe that you maintain that position in statute in which you would refer to as ab initio. There you go. So just record whatever I just said and listen to it, and that's the perfect sentence. Well, not perfect, but it's whole and complete. Yes, yeah, so it is perfect, you know. That's how you write it. it. Took me a year to come up with that little stupid ditty. Not only do I believe it's true, but I believe you maintain the statute and within your statutes this position that, and then fill in the blank. It would be referred to as that initial. Not saying that I know, but I believe that you maintain this position in your statute. Not that I know. I'm not saying. I'm saying I believe you maintain this position. I'm not saying it's true. I think you maintain this position. Because you're a statute and you're rigid, and I believe this is the second dimension. The first to it is ab initio. A freaking year to come up with that one little sentence, but boy, it works for so many things, it's not even funny. But you just got to minimize everything. That's what I do. I just minimize everything. You know, minimalist extraordinaire. I just, that's the, that's a big German thing. Every, the Germans trying to miniaturize every freaking thing. Get it down to the basic, simplest thing to make it work and still function at the size of a pin of a needle. It's like, wow, you got it to work yet? Damn right, I didn't. We just like to do it. We like to make things simple. If like one that. writes a, a notice and uses Latin and turns it in, and in court the judge possibly gets up and walks out? No, the um, judge could, or no, the judge, no, no, the judge, what he, the judge, how, I mean, that's what I love telling people all the time. How would you like, oh, we, we used to have an issue. Okay, now how would you like this very learned, very wise, very educated judge to say every single thing in that hearing and trial in Latin? You speak Latin, why can't he speak Latin? Then what are you going to do, smart guy? How are you going to answer him? You're going to be like, I have no idea what you're doing. Yeah, you did. Right here, I have an issue. Da, 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 da. Look at all these Latin words you used. I'm going to use them. If you could use them, I could use them. Why are all you allowed to use them? All because you think you want to play. Pretend that you're a smart guy. Pretend that you learn it. Pretend that you studied in Latin. Pretend. Oh, you want to pretend? Yeah, I'll, I'll show you some pretending. Let's pretend. Let's pretend that you're going to understand what I have to say. So talk on a common man, common parlance level. Stop talking all up. Let, let me put it this way. Some guy got on my show from England. Great, great phone call. The guy said to me, he said, the, the judge said to him in open court, if you want to do this common law procedure, I recommend highly you stick to one syllable words. The judge said that to him. And this is why I keep telling everybody, use one. So if you do it three syllables, try to get it down to two. You get it down to two, try to get it to one. Everything I did, everything I do, I try to make it one syllable. Talk simple. There's no loopholes. There's no way to get out of that word. Keep it one syllable. Simple. Word. Like 
me, Tarzan, you, Jane, Jane Steele, Bone, Give Back Bone. That's it. That's my whole freaking claim. That's my whole case. That's my whole freaking everything. Jane can't get out of it. I don't want nothing. Is that my pro, is that my that's my bone? Give it back. It's been working since caveman time. It'll work today. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Tarzan did it. It's done. Let's move on. Go enjoy the sunshine. Get away from the two syllable, three syllable words. We got this covered. Thousands of years. You don't have to get creative. And that's what's killing you guys. And they see it. When you use two, three syllable words, they know you don't have a freaking clue what you're doing. Oh, you're going to try to talk up to me. Oh, we're word nerds. Oh, you want to cross words with us? Oh, you really. Let's play. Let's have a game. They're going to eat you for lunch. Talk like a man, and they'll know you're the talking to the meeting of man. How did God do the commandments? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. You know, what did he say? Well, let's be reasonable about this. At times, you know, we could, you know, he didn't, he didn't start using two, three syllable words. Made it simple, made it clear. That's the law. Simple and clear. Not ambiguous. If it's ambiguous, it's not good law. I mean, that, you could actually Google that. If it's ambiguous, it's not good law. You could actually do quote unquote, if it's ambiguous, it's not good law. And you'll see it's in so many statutes and so many code books all over the world. That's basically a general golden rule. If you could have more than one interpretation for a word, it's not, it would not make uh, good law. Like if I said to you, what does uh, the word blue mean to you? And why? And what would it mean? Um, I would think color first. Perfect. 99% of people Earth would think it means color first. 1% to 2%, you know, let's say 95% think it's a color. 1% to 2% would say, uh, blue, it's a feeling, it's an emotion. Another person would say blue, you mean like I blew up birthday candles? Another person would say blue, you mean like a, you know, a, a, a form of a, uh, American African music that they brought over with them from Africa. They you know, the, the blues. There's a style of music. You know, blue. You know what? You know. So, like I said, so a good law. If you said the word blue, and there was something in there that had to do with color, that would make good law. It would make sense to everybody. Ninety-five percent of the common poems, the common man, the common law, the people would understand that word. And Algonquin blue means, you know, they say it a different way. They might say it. They might say, um, you know, pish posh might be the word blue for them. But we wouldn't know what that means, but they know what it means. It's their common term, their common parlance, their common law. And when I was talking to Bill Thornton on another guy's show, Bill started to understand what I was trying to say. It's like, Bill, you're doing old English common law for the old English Crown Legal Society, Bar Association. I said, that's not common law of the Algonquins, of the Welsh people, of the Irish or whoever was over there. I said, it's not the common people or common terms of art. People didn't know what a trove or a pleb was, I guarantee in merry old England. Only legal lawyers did. It's not common law. It's common law for the Bar Association. Common law for the Crown. That's their common terms. That's their common policy. That's their common words. I said, why are you trying to use it in Los Angeles, California, or Palm Springs? Where? What are you doing? I don't get it. Orange County, whatever. What are you doing? It doesn't make any sense. Talk simple. What kind of people live in Orange County? Hey, Carl, thank you very much. Um, I want to say it's uh, awesome to hear. This is Mark in Atlanta, by the way. Um, hey, Mark, how you doing? It's awesome to hear. I'm well. It's, I'm I'm very uh, heartwarmed about your story with your family. It's uh, it's awesome to hear that it worked out the way it did. Yeah, you still can't hug me. That's all right. I shook your hand. I got that in. Ah, that's close enough, man. That's all you get. <laughs> Thank you, Gnostic yeah. One. Thank you, Angela. Oh, you are, oh, I didn't realize it was you, Gnostic One. Holy crap. <laughs> Had a good because I got I got an answer out of you that I kind of wanted, so that's great. Uh, Thank yeah, you very much. We, yeah, when you're an Angela, we you were, sound a lot more formal. I get it. <laughs> yeah, okay, we, I get it. We, there's been this, uh, not I don't want to say a risk, but just a big discussion on this this particular subject, Ed Nishio and Void Judgment, in the Void Judgment room, with, um, you know, Debbie Dad, uh, Mo from Europe, and because yeah, he used it, yeah. I guess he used it before he heard of you, so that's that's what I read. Um, I, I don't want to speak for him and what he's done, so he's not here, but uh, maybe that's no, another, doing, another thing. Yeah, he's doing good. I, I emailed him today. I'm well, not emailed him, text message. I don't even email anybody. I've been so, except for my kid, I emailed Mo when I saw her thing come through. I was like, Merlin, who? So what the hell is this, Merlin? Uh, 
I'm, I'm glad I asked. How many Yeah, but like I said, the big thing was this uh, with Maurice, man. Uh, he handled open court was a hell of a performance. And it's, like I said, uh, he's like 90% me. I mean, when I heard his before, he the paperwork isn't anything like I do. You know, his style isn't isn't like what I do. But when he was an open court boy, could he perform? And it's a hell of a performance, and it's a lot of fun. It's just like, you know, like uh, when you go to, like, uh, dealing with a judge, and the judge yells out in open court, who put this notice into this court? They better take this notice out. And it's like, uh, you know, are you practicing law from the bench? Is that a threat? Are you, uh, you know, giving legal advice? Are you my attorney? Are you, you know, you know, like I said, it's fun the way he was doing the judge in England the way I do the judges over here. Okay. You know, he walked over into a court in England, and the judge said, you know, he told his friend, don't open your mouth, don't say a word, just hold my arm, and we'll go arm and arm before the court. We could do this. Just keep your mouth shut, and let's do this. So the judge kept yelling out, who is, like this guy's name, Mo or Maurice, he's like, who is Sam? And uh, the judge looked at Mo and said, are you Sam? He's like, no, I'm a man, and I'm here to give aid and comfort to my fellow man. And then the judge said, well, no, you're not. And he says, uh, like, you know, you know, a rule of court, you know, uh, like, can you give me, like, you know, a ruling on the court? Can you give me a ruling on this? Either A, what, I am not a man, or B, I'm not here to give aid and comfort to my fellow man. Which one is not true? So it's it hysterical the way, you know, it, it, that's the, exactly the best thing you could do when they walk in and stand. It's like, are you Sam? No, I'm not Sam, but I'm here I'm here as a man to give aid and comfort to my fellow manager. I said, no, you're not. So the judge was trying to basically say, get out of my court. So he flipped it around on her and questioned her. He said, you know, can you give me a rule? ruling here? You know, point of law. You know, A, am I not a man? Are you telling me I'm not a man? Or B, are you telling me I'm not here to aid and comfort my fellow man, which I clearly am? So the judge never had anybody mouth back to the judge because the judges are just gorillas who are never questioned. And, us, you know, the, the guys with the little wigs over there are scared out of their minds when this big gorilla with the, 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 the wigs that hit the freaking floor. And some of these guys have like this little beanie, ghost, you know, like skull cap, Jewish kind of yarmulke size wig. It looks ridiculous. And these judges, some of these judges, like, wigs that hit the freaking floor. I was like, oh, you know, what? Oh, I'm supposed to be intimidated because your wig is so big? Oh, this is ridiculous. But they are. They're intimidated. So when the big wig says something, the little wigs just all sit down and shut up. So he didn't sit down and shut up. You know, he actually questioned. And the big wig was like, holy cow, nobody's going to backsass me. Nobody's actually, you know, said, you know, point of law. <laughs> Am I not a man? It was like, and that's like I said, what I do. And the judge goes bananas and says, you know, who wrote this notice? You know, they're practicing law without a license. It's like, yeah, well, I don't think anybody in the state of Illinois has got a license to practice law. I guess you better ban every piece of paper that's been put in any case, you know, for the last 50 years because nobody's got a license to practice law in the state of Illinois. You know, well, I highly recommend that this notice leaves. Oh, now you're recommending. You know, now you're giving me a highly recommended opinion. Oh, isn't that special? First, you'd like, get this notice out of this case, which is communicating a threat or extortion or what. You're going to hold me in contempt. You're going to break my legs, put me in a cage. No, that notice stays right where it lies. So you better remove it. Oh, yeah, or what? You practically, you, you know, you're acting on my behalf. You're acting, you know, on my benefit. You're bearing all liability. You're an attorney. Oh, like I said, it's just fun to start knocking them down to the size. You know, so it's a lot of fun. You know what? Guess who's coming mm-hmm. on? Oh, Dean Clifford, he's calling in now, and he oh, says he's on the Skype, and he said he wanted to talk to you also. Uh-oh. So stay Alrighty. on there, my dear. Yeah, I'm um, going to mute out. Let, I'm going to mute out a little bit and let you introduce him. Okay, he's calling in now, so right, um, out, let me I'll give him the – oh, he's asking for the number, 724-444-7444. Three nine nine oh four. Yay! Um, let's see. Chelsea is uh, guest one one four. She had her hand up. I guess she wanted to speak to you also. So oh, funny. Um, he's probably he's two hours behind or an hour and a half behind. So maybe he's calling right on time because it's quarter eleven. So it's quarter to nine by him. So he's calling right on time. He's wonder just on whatever Manitoba time, yeah, or whatever. That's funny. 
I just, um, Dean, when you get on the call, I don't know if he can hear me. Dean, if, well, he's calling in right now. Let me just tell him to to, pre, to well, raise his introduce, hand. Well, why don't you introduce yeah. him? I'm trying to explain a little bit who he is to people who've never heard of him. I'll mute out for a couple minutes. Well, he's on. Let me see where he is. Um, can you raise your hand by pressing star 8, Dean? Because I don't know. Let me see here. There you are, Manitoba. Hooray! Yay, you made it. <laughs> I did finally make it. Oh, man, I was the whole way back, I was like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. Oh, I'm so glad oh, you I'm made so it. Glad. I thought you were going to stand me up again. And like, uh, no, I only did that the once. I learned my lesson off that one. And, oh, man. Yeah, boy, what a busy month, though. I'm glad. I actually only have missed one uh, one show so far in the last month, and I think I've been on about 20 now since I've been out, so it's getting crazy. I you need to speak up a little bit so we can barely hear you. That I can do. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, we've been chatting with Carl. Carl's been giving us um, an update on what's going on with him. And you mentioned you wanted to speak to Carl? Absolutely, yeah. I've been speaking with a lot of people over the last few weeks. Uh, eternally aware there, John Spears, up here in Canada as well. Uh, Carl, I know, has spoken to a few people that uh, that I'm really good friends with uh, for the 16 months there when I was in jail. I was stuff, uh Pass back and forth for me, so yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to get a hold of everybody right now that I'm up. So. Good. Yeah, you've been out what since January, right? Sorry, say it again. You've been out since January, right? I'm. I've been one month to the day today. Say it again. I have been out for one month to the day as of oh. today. All right, one month. Okay, that's all. Yeah, March. So, yeah, definitely not been out since January. Uh, yeah, no, my 16 months ended uh, one, one month ago today so far. So. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's been good. <laughs> Carl, did you want to say something? You're on and you're on. on. Oh, I was just saying I was talking to Dean's brother and some friend of his that went up to Hamilton and they met me. And I was trying to give them, I was drilling them as hard as I can, trying to tell you exactly what not to do, not what to do, but what not to do. That was the big thing. It's not so much what you do, it's what you don't do. Was was really important, and I kept drilling it into him. I said, "Will you stop playing with these people?" I said, "You know, it, it, you're never going. They're never going to recognize anything that you're doing. You could be the best in legalese and best code decipher and the best president. You could be the best pretend pro se attorney on planet Earth, and they will never give you the time of day. You're not a member of their club. They don't care. You're not a full carrying bar member. They don't care." No, that's uh, there, there's no truer words. They simply they they don't care. It's all about jurisdiction. And there's you have no standing in those courts. Like this. So there's no point in even speaking when you're in there. Yeah, I don't know if uh, you heard the very beginning part of the show. I said, oh, I said when I read the transcript, I was going bananas. I was saying when the judge said to you, uh, well, every time I call your name, Mr. Clifford, you respond. So obviously we have control over you over jurisdiction because obviously you are responding. So obviously we, you know put input in, we get input out. So uh, I was kept saying, it's like all Dean had to say at that point was, yes, I am Dean Clifford, but which one, the legal person or the man? Which one does this court wish to intercourse with? Yeah, that's all no, had to I, say. and that's actually for the first month, I think uh, through about 15 different hearings, it's exactly every time they, they said something like that to me, a lot of these transcripts we can't get, a lot of them have been altered. Exactly what I did. Exactly. I, said, I said, I am a Dean Clifford, I am not he, the Dean Clifford you're looking for. Right, but what is funny is you are Dean Clifford the person and you're Dean Clifford the man. They created Dean Clifford the person, but you can't accept such a lovely, you know, benefit at this time, you know, because I don't know how to intercourse in the legal world in the legal, as a legal person. But if you want to talk to Dean Clifford the man, any man on planet Earth wants to intercourse with man on man to Dean Clifford, I'm the man. I'm here for you. Well, and that's, and that's it, it, it finally got to that uh, by the time my, uh, my last hearing came around that I was in at the uh, last two hearings in front of the Superior Court judge. He finally started addressing me as, well, uh, uh, Mr. Clifford, man to man, blah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 and he'd keep talking and, uh, because I basically was I was refusing to, uh, to, to participate in any way until he clarified who it was he was actually trying to speak to. And that's right after that, that was the day I got bail approved, no problem. No cash well, that's bail. Exactly, that's exactly. That's ex- that's what, well, see, this is what I learned because I'm, I'm, I'm probably like 10 years. I'm not sure how old you are. I'm 50, 51 years old, so I'm not sure how old you are. But this is what I learned from the Freeman of Montana what happened was the federal court judge, these men, um, Swipes, and there was another man, uh, Bivens or Givens, I don't remember his name. But when they went on trial, they, they were good ranching people. They were millionaires. They, they weren't, you know, 
they weren't, uh, this is you know. Leroy Schweitzer, right? Montana Freeman. Yeah, Leroy Schweitzer, right? And it was another man who was uh, very, very serious, you know, very Bible, very Old Testament. He knew every single thing about American flags and eagles and why they face to the left and not the right and why they hold arrows. And he knew everything. So it was so funny when they opened up the United States District Court, he starts, they say, you don't have a jurisdiction over us, and that eagles this, and this is that. And the judge was like looking all around, and he's like, this, the, the, the bench that you're behind is a temple, you're part of the Illuminati, the, the, the Jesuits, and the priest, and he's like, the cloak, and the robe, and he's like, and the priest is like, huh, and the, and the judge is like, huh, wow, really? So this was what I learned was, was great with that trial. The district court judge, criminal judge, stood up, took off his robe, kicked the American flag to the ground, pulled the chair right in front of the, the, the free men, spun it around, said, okay, talk to me, man to man, what's going on out here? And they froze. They knew all of that legal nonsense. They knew everything about a flag. They knew everything about the Bible. They knew everything about the structure of old English common law. They forgot how to talk man to man. So what was funny is the judge took up. He said, you got nothing to say? You got nothing to say? Fine. Keep it that way. You say one more damn thing about the Bible or anything, I'll have you gagged. So he got up, got on his robe, they started on with their spiel again, and they were just gay for the rest of the trial. But they gave him a chance to speak man to man. But see, the, the poor Freeman and Montana guys didn't know that the judge was saying, okay, you want to evoke the common law? Let's do this. Talk to me man to man. What's going on? And let's see if we can work this out. Yep, you know you know, he just entered common law when they take the robe off. Uh, far from the first time I've heard of that happening and seen that happen now. So. Yep. Like I said, if they talk to you man to man, you got something going. Yep. Now, now you're in the proper jurisdiction, but uh, it's you don't expect it when it happens, though. Sometimes I've noticed that, and you just all like prepared for a fight at the other end, and all of a sudden you're in the proper one. You're like, oh man. Now well, that's as I said. You, if all you evoked at the very first time, you didn't have to say this. Common law said, look, yes, it is true. I, it is I, Dean Clifford, but the legal person that you, the crown, created or for, for my benefit and for the other benefit of other citizens and of other persons of Canada, yes, lovely, or the man, Dean Clifford. Now, I will accept, you know, the title and responsibility of a man causing any harm to his fellow man, and I'm here to compensate for anything wrong. Is any man going to be up here in this court or in any near proceedings in which I get compensated for doing something wrong? I'm, I, I'll pay. I, I got the checkbook. I'm ready to go. How can we settle this? Yep. Tend to me, tend to me a proposal. Yep. No, so if you started with something that, like that, uh, if you started with something like that, it would have over. Kind of stuff in the courtroom, uh, there, was, there was the one hearing where I had my mic, uh, they had me on the camera, and the judge ordered the clerk to shut my microphone off so they couldn't hear me anymore. And then proceeded yeah. to, as long as she could hear, uh, the, you can see on the transcript, the clerk says, uh, or the, court, the judge says, well, as long as he can hear us, I don't care, I don't care him. There was right. one, and then there was five other hearings where I was actually grabbed by sheriffs and, uh, and dragged out of the courtroom before I finished my well, look, sentence. Well, look what happened with some man up there in uh, Saskatchewan. He calls me up there in one of my shows, and he says to me, he says, call, he said, call, kind of, court was kind of good and kind of bad today. So what do you mean? He says, well, that little thing that you wrote for me? He's like, yeah. He says, well, I gave a copy of the Crown when I walked in, and I gave a copy to the judge. I said, yeah, what happened? He said, well, the, the Crown says, we don't understand anything on this paper. He says, all these words, they mean nothing to us. So then the judge says, but I understand every single, I understand every single word. See, so I said to the man, do you not understand what's going on? He says, no. I said, the judge understands you're evoking the common law. The crown can't answer or the respond because those words, certain words like man, wrong, don't exist in their world. So they can't understand it. They can't move under those words. They can't answer it because if they did, they'd be disrobing themselves, they'd be uncloaking themselves, unmasking themselves, depersonalizing themselves, and they would have to be talking to you man to man, which they will never do because they'll have full liability. I said, so I it worked out wonderful. Liability themselves personally. He didn't realize how wonderful it was that the prosecutor said, I cannot answer anything. I don't, these words are not known to me. I said, that's perfect. I said, dude, you, you won. He's like, what? Because there's no bunny on the other side. You present a proposal or, you know, or you present an offer to them or, you know, like, I wish to do this and, you know, just tell me that. And nobody's ever going to answer. And it's just like what happened with Jason up in Canada. He's a great guy to get in touch with if you know who Jason is out there in uh, Kelowna. He had Winston Trout seminar. You, if you ever watched the Winston Trout seminar in Kelowna, Jason is the one who got them all together. But when Winston went out there, they did the Winston process, and 571 of those folks got caught up with it, 
and Jason called me up not too long ago. He said, well, the Crown had to stay the 571 proceedings against us because of that simple question you asked them. You know, and he said it worked out great. He says that's been stayed indefinitely yep. until they answered. They said to the court, the Crown said, we cannot proceed at this time. We're going to have to stay the procedure indefinitely until we can provide an answer. They're never going to be able to answer it. They can't answer. Like, whose property are we talking about? Is this my money? Whose property are we talking about? Just a simple question. Because the government can't make a claim for property. Only man can make a claim for property. So they, they, their hands are tied. Of course, like I say, it was, it, it, the only reason what man got together since caveman time, two men, you know, three men, five men, six men got together, not men. Men and men are not the same. When, why man gets together is to secure and protect the property of each other's. So when this is the golden rule, this is like the mission statement of every government. I don't care where you are, people get together to secure and protect their property for their fellow man from foreign invaders. So when you go to the government, you just say, hey, I've got a claim. You know, my property's been stolen. It's been robbed. You know, have you found it? Do you know where it is? Can you know, can you tell me where it is? Can you locate it for me? Can you track it down? Can you return it immediately? And they will because that's their mission statement. That's their whole agenda. That's supposed to be their job, yeah. And they do it. Because, like I said, go to uh, YouTube and go um, James uh, Daly, Return of Birds or Birds of Prey. And he said, this actually happened in Quebec. I told the, the man who had this, he brought a whole bunch of birds in, imported illegally, no vaccination, no paperwork, no nothing. And this was actually in Quebec. So I was wondering if it worked in Napoleonic as well. So if you go listen to Mr. Daly. He has got the biggest private zoo up there in Canada called the uh, Lion African Safari over there in uh, north of Hamilton. And he's like, call, I went to court with this man, and he accepted all the fines, all the penalties, all the fees, which you make a payment of a dollar a day for the next 10 billion years. It doesn't matter what the fines, penalty, the crown assesses upon you. So what? Accept it and pay a dollar a gazette the century. Who cares? They just want to see that the books balance. It doesn't matter to them if they actually physically get payments in full at one time, make payments. And then he said to the court in French, oh, he says, yeah, by the way, I'm going to require the court to return my property immediately. And then the judge said to the crown prosecutor, return this man's property. And then the prosecutor said, what? That's crazy. And the judge said, return a property forthwith. And then he, the man said that he, he then the prosecutor said, mm, okay. And he left the courtroom and he said, when the man left the courtroom, he said he heard the prosecutor and the judge just screaming at each other because the judge was like, hey, the guy said open sesame. That's the magic word. He said property. What, what, what do you want me to do? I'm, I'm, my hands are bound. Like Jesse and Jonathan, they got their four kids back because I told Jonathan, Je, Jonathan wouldn't listen to me. You know, he had this great big two-hour spiel he put before the court, but Je, Jesse did. I only worked with us for 10 days. I said, do you know the lady who took your kid? Did you actually physically see somebody touch and trespass on your property? Yeah, good. Can you, When you walk into the court, point her out into the court and say, that, that woman robbed me of my property. And the judge I know is a mandated reporter. He has to report any term. He hears a crime of murder or rape or anything in his courtroom during testimony, he's got to report it to either the local prosecutor or the sheriff's department. He's a, I've got a couple of friends who are judges. They're mandated reporters. So what's funny is the judge said, well, don't you care why she robbed you of your property? Because they had guns and drugs in the house and, you know, the kids weren't being, you know, fed, and, you know, in a proper manner according to the government. So uh, she said, why would, and I said, look, just tell the judge, well, if I was raped, why do I care why I was raped? I was wrong return my property immediately. And then the judge said, okay, uh, just said that uh, the court will be in recess. And I was uh, at 5 o'clock, they were told to leave, you know, come back at 8.30 tomorrow morning. They said they came uh, into the lobby at 8.30 in the morning at Queen's Bench in New Brunswick. Crown prosecutor walked out with a little, you know, two-sentence ditty claim I gave. And he said, who wrote this? And she said she did, because they got to write it in French on one side and English on the other. I said, who wrote there? And she said, well, obviously, it's a woman's handwriting. Do you know what this means? And she said, it means you've got to give me back my property. She said, well, he's like, yeah, it means that. But whoever wrote this, and she said on my show, she said, tell him we're scared poopless. I said, he said poopless. It's like, okay, he said, can I curse? And she's like, yeah, he said, tell him we're scared shitless. And when do you want your property? She said immediately, she said, well, we scattered under the four corners of New Brunswick. We never intended on you people ever seeing these kids again. Can you give us till Friday before you start assessing a dollar a second payments for holding uh, the property in naked possession? She said, yeah, we'll hold off on declining for, you know, naked possession. 
So they got back their kids. And it only took me 10 days. And plenty of parents called up my show and said, Jesus called. Well, we did. Some lady in the Saskatchewan or Manitoba told another lady in the Saskatchewan Manitoba, just go to the, the social services up there and just say you want your property back. The lady went up there. She, she went to the, the receptionist. The receptionist said, you know, have a seat. You're like a crazy lady. Two hours later, they dropped it, gave it to the kid, and the, the kid, they left. No paper, no nothing. Amazing what a, a Pro- claim can do, eh? Property is the magic word. Yep. You know, because property is that which is profit to a man, exclusive as to all others within a society in which he may only use and enjoy for his own use. If anybody else wishes to enjoy to use it, they must get his permission, or, or if they don't, it would be considered a trespass. Yep. It's that simple. And there's only two wrongs. I got that from Billy Thornton, trespass and trespass on a case. So once I put my case before the court and the court clerks started to do the Jesse's case, because Jesse's case was like a two little sentence claim, they started saying, this isn't the Arsenal Court. This is Queen's Bench. I said, we wrote it, Arsenal Court at Queen's Bench in Brunswick. And the court clerk said, no, this is Queen's Bench. It's like, no, it's Jesse's court. It's the Arsenal Court. She's making a claim in this public building. She's bringing her court to this public building, and you will recognize it because you're the clerks. You maintain it. Here comes the king. Here comes the queen. Here comes the creator of this court. Man. So, man, they flipped when they saw what we were putting into the court. So so simple. We are the authority. Well, like I said, at the very beginning of my show, my kid was taken because he had downs. I haven't seen my kids in seven years. So I finally seen them on St. Patrick's Day for the first time. I said to my mom, what's it been, like five years? I've been, you know, away. She said, it's seven. And I don't even know what they look like. I said, can you point them out? They're in church. I said, there's 12 kids here. Can you point them out? She said, the tall one and the long-haired one. I said, holy cow, they grew. So like I said, I dedicated myself big time to this just to try to get my kids back from the government. And then once I you know, started, I got my kids back, I said, let me see if I could help others. And uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm really very free. lucky. That's all it is. It's all property. It's all property. Thank God for John Locke, you know. I mean, I could I could refer back where I've gotten all my stuff from. And like I said, if you go to my website, it's uh, uh, broadmind.org. Some, I got very lucky that some uh, nice man who looks like George Foreman, big guy from Texas, Larry, he uh, sent me a letter from Ohio, a court in Ohio. And it said that, you know, he said these women are fantastic at writing legal documents. And the judge simply wrote to them, thank you for your... Um, petition to the court or motion before the court, but we cannot grant it at this time, even though you have many numerous and uh, legal conclusions, which may be like true or accurate, we see nowhere within the state of Ohio where it's recorded that you're an attorney, so at this time we're going to have to deny you. So no matter how good you are at their game, they're going to always say, you could study their nonsense for years. I could have probably been one of the best attorneys in the United States. I studied that stuff like you got no freaking idea. You should have seen my original lawsuits. like 300 freaking pages. It was insane. And I tell people where to find it on Pace. I said, you want to see Insanity? Go look at my first lawsuits back in 2001. Go take a look. And then 2003, they come. They that game. They can do whatever they want. Right. So no matter how dedicated you are, it's a joke. And like I said, one of the best phone calls I ever got, I said to these folks earlier, was over in England. Some man called me up and he says, call, he said, the judge very clearly said that if you want to play the common law game, I highly recommend that you keep it to one syllable words. And that's coming out of the judge's mouth. And this is what I say every time on my show. If you could do it in three syllables, do it in two. If you do it in two, do it in one. Never use Latin because they could respond to you in kind. Every single thing that they could talk to you now in court, if you use a Latin word like ab initio, how would you like it if every single other word that came out of their mouth was in Latin? You want to be a smart guy? Oh, we'll be smart. You want to play Let's play. We'll, we'll, we'll cross words. Everything you're saying. Oh, they'll destroy you. Talk like a man. Because no other man will appear. Call them out, man to man. They have to appear as a man. You can invoke the common law. You have the right as man that created that court. Man is the creator of these courts. Public service needs to create these courts. Man. If you're a man, they yeah. have to be something of equal weight, something of equal value. Yeah. They have to. Well, you don't have you. You have a duty and obligation to your fellow man. You're not sovereign. Only God's sovereign. Only God has the ca- capacity to ignore the law. God is impervious to law. God could walk through walls. I can't. I can't levitate. I can't grab. I. I. I am bound by law. Natural law. Nature's law. I'm bound by law. I'm not sovereign, but I am a man. I'm in the image of God. 
you know, since, you know, so as far as I'm concerned, I'm the creator of Frankenstein. I'm the creator of these courts. I'm the creator of the public servants. I'm the creator of the governments. Man is the creator of all this. God created man, so man created everything else. The word sovereign, I think it's just generally understood, they mean sovereign under God, which means you still answer to him. Well, like I said, uh, like I said, I actually, because I was hearing a lot of people using the word sovereign, and sovereign was something that basically says that is, possesses God-like qualities or is not bound by law. And God's not bound by law. I am. So to me, I'm not you're sovereign. You're sovereign of whatever you create. Yeah, you, you, right. You would have the capacity to rule over it, to have godlike qualities. But for me to call myself sovereign when I actually know there is another sovereign would kind of be a mockery. Do you, are you sovereign over the what you create? Yes. Are you sovereign? No. But you know what I'm saying. So I try not to use that word. Yes, I'm sovereign over what I create. You know, I just say, look, I'm very happy to accept the title of that of a man. Is there any other man who's going to come forth and make a claim I've done anything wrong? What higher title and would be other than God? And this is what I always said to people. I had a great guy who used to do my show with me and from Chicago. His mom was an English teacher and his dad was a professor in ITT. So what was funny is I said to him, can you please explain to these people when you use an adjective, how you diminish the capacity of a noun? When you say first the word I, that's just in the image of God, the lowercase I, you know, that's, that's the image of God. One, God, man, comes after that. You could stop right there. Or, like I do, I put a lot in the four corner brackets. I can put my name in there. So people know how to refer that man to as Colette's. But it's the four corner bracket. It means it's there, but it's not there on paper. It's just for your convenience and my convenience. So we could communicate with each other instead of calling each other, hey, man, hey, man, you call me Colette's. But once you start putting down plaintiff, defendant, U.S. Marine, ex felon, dad, son, you're diminishing the capacity of that of being a man. Why didn't you just hold the status and the, and the title of man? Why did you reduce yourself to son or uncle or where you're showing there's duties and obligations to other family members? It's none of their damn business. The only thing they need to know is that you're a man. That's all they need to know. You and you only have a duty you only have a duty and obligation you to your fellow man. Or you can find it something. Or you what? The more you try to define something, the more you can find it to something. You diminish it more than right. you try to describe That's it. Right. More. right. A man is unlimited in his capacity. So, once you start putting that I am a member of a family, ah, well, then I have duties and obligations to brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. He, you know, so, like I said, I'm diminishing my status. So, right now, I'm just saying I, a man. And I'll put the full corner brackets, call lens. That's it. Well, it's just like and that's, 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 that's people that are doing, saying I am. Yeah, I am. And but, like I said, after that, I like it. it. If you start listing all the things you are, then you confine it to what you list and you remove everything you haven't specifically listed, where if you leave it just I am... It well, the only thing it. about the, the other way I look at it as saying I am is like basically it's almost like a godlike quality because I, to me, is God. It's the symbol of one, the symbol of God. We all come from the one. So if you just say I am, it's basically to me saying you almost like think you believe that you have a godlike quality, that you are I. And to me, God is I. That's just my personal opinion. I'm saying, I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just trying to say, this is the way I've looked at it. And, you know, and this is the way, it seems to work really well, what I write for court. Like I said, when we did that in England, I wrote a, the, probably the shortest lawsuit, the shortest claim in English history. It says, I, a man, and then a full corner bracket, Balrash man, claim wrong, trespass, see exhibit A. And that was it. It was eight freaking words. And I said to the court, I mean, did it right there at the counter. Of course, the smart-ass guy that I brought there, was taking me around London to take photos. I said, look, dude, why don't we just go to court? Take, you know, we'll take photos later. Let's just, oh, we got plenty of time. It's open till 5. No, it was only open till 4.30. When he got there with a briefcase, he had his son's briefcase for school, like drawings and coloring. I said, where's your claim? His claim was like 50, you know, 50 lines long, thousands of words, but that's the best he could do. He said, that's the shortest he could do it in five weeks' work with me. I said, okay. I said, you've got to stand behind every single word in that claim, and if you get to utter it in open court, you have to get it word for word correct. You can't, you'll can't. novate if you get something wrong, but go ahead. If that's the best you could do, do it. So then he, he had two minutes, and he's like, oh, my God, I got the wrong briefcase. I said, that's okay. Ask this lovely lady, nice African lady, you know, ask her for a pen, paper, and, you know, and ask her how much time we got. Two minutes? You can do this. I said, whose court is it? It's your court. It's going to be your court. You're going to pull the man court. His name was Man, M-A-N-N court. Where? Where do you want to hold it? At Queen's Bench. Okay. Now, what's your name? 
Bob Archman, I see up at the top. You're the prosecutor, right? Okay. You're the prosecutor. And who's the man underneath you? Barry Rose, right? Okay. He's the wrongdoer. Okay. And now put it on the side of the caption where you put trespass. What did he do? Breach of enclosure. The cop came onto your property, right? Okay, he breached an enclosure. I said, okay, now write the claim. You know, it was funny. He was watching the clock. I said, don't watch the clock. We still got like 87 seconds. We got plenty of time for this. Write your claim out. He was like, well, I didn't say write your claim. I said, what, did he do you wrong? Yeah, what did he do? He did a trespass. Say, I, a man, followers, man, full corner bracket, claim wrong trespass. See Exhibit A. And I said, that's it. And I said, Exhibit A could fill this building. Exhibit A could be the size of a tractor trailer. It doesn't matter. But on your Exhibit A is actually going to be the policeman's report saying how he crossed over the gate of the neighbor, crossed over your hedgerow, came across your farm, took photos. Your Exhibit A is going to be the cop's testimony. Okay? So I said to that lovely lady behind the counter, she had a hand on his iron gate ready to slam it down on our face. I said, ma'am, is this a proper claim? Is this a lawsuit? She said, absolutely. And I said, can you please stamp it? And she said, but you got to go across the hallway and pay for it. I said, we'll do that, ma'am, not a problem. And, uh, and it was done. Eight words. I guarantee it was the shortest lawsuit, shortest claim in English history. It's that simple. There's nothing amazing about this. And, yeah, and, and we, we prevailed in court on, uh, you can see that on court uh, on YouTube or uh, Brian Garris show, uh, UK column, December 17th, 2013. If you Google it, you'll see how we explain how uh, you'll see the man. Uh, the Punjabi, the Indian man, comes on before me for about a half an hour, and I explain, you know, to uh, Brian Garrish what I did in court. I said, it's so simple, it's scary. I said, you know, we, we appeared as a person because it was so funny. This poor guy, he studied with me for five weeks. I was over there in England, and Angel kept saying, he said, oh, you seen the London Tower of London, the Kevin Key with the Queen? I said, no, I'm looking at a cement plaque factory in a, in a hotel room because this guy is trying to learn how to walk in the court and kick ass. The very first thing he, he learned was like, he, he like tricks when you go to court. Well, the judge says this and do this, and the judge says that and do this. I said, this is not pull the next trick out of it, you know. And all he kept doing was pulling the rabbit out of the hat. Three times in a row, pulled the rabbit out. The judge kept saying, is the person known as da-da-da before the court? And he says, I'm a man. And he said, is the person known as Baal Rashman before the court? I'm a man. Is the, is the person known as Baal? He said, well, if the, if the person will not appear today, we will reschedule this for six months. And I said, oh, no, I am not coming back to Mary Old England. So I jumped up from the gallery, and I said, may I assist this court? Because the person at whom this court seeks, Baal Rajman, is present before this court today. And, ba- and he looked at me. He's like, what? You throw me under the bus, dude? I said, look, I am not coming back to England in six months. I am not doing this. I'm done with England. And the court clerk lady walked over to me. He says, how may you assist the court? I said, the person known as Baal Rajman is before the court. I said, the only problem is a person is a man, but according to his duty and his rank within the society, they may impose upon him if he fails to perform his duty. If he's derelict in his duty. He is a person, but fortunately for me, he's brown. So fortunately for me, he's Punjabi. So he is a person within the Punjabi culture and person within the Punjabi society. He is not an Englishman. He is, he is not a member of the Crown. He has no duty and obligation as a Crown person. He is not any personage to the Crown society. And I will prove that in court, that the person that you seek is before the court but he is not a person which you have jurisdiction authority over. No, it's just, but it's a class of person. That's all this is all about. It's classes of person, period. It's what, what, what per, the person is a member of a society, but which society? Yep. And that's the whole we trick. We clarify that, so we leave everything open to their, their speculation. And their so I, right, so, so when I was, right, so that's, that's how I got to sit next to him in an open court, because they said, the judge then said, Present yourself to the court. I said, he said, what's your name? I said, my name is Carl Lentz. He said, how do you spell it? L-E-N-T-Z. He said, so Carl Lentz. I said, okay, L-E-N-T-Z. Okay, Z, not Z. Z. It's all Carl Lentz. He says, and what, what makes you believe that you have any uh, knowledge or any, uh, you know, that would aid in the sister's court? I said, well, I come from the United States, and I wrote a law dictionary, and I do a little law show on my own. He says, uh, any word that you want me to help interpret for the court, I'll be more than glad to assist, like the word it's known as person. The court seemed to have difficulty defining the word person. So I think everybody knows the word is crystal clear now, what a person is. I said, I think we can proceed. He says, uh, I wish to be his next friend. And the judge says, I don't understand that term. And the Crown prosecutor said, it's holding me.